Welcome back. Good morning. My name is Yang Yong Gyeong, journalist at Herald Business and the MC of today's forum. We will now begin part one of the forum. Please use the receivers on the tables to use the interpretation service and set the receivers on channel 1 for Korean and channel 2 for English. For those watching us live, please select the language of your choice between Korean and English to enjoy the forum. The first keynote speaker is Dr. Douglas Terrier, Chief Technologist of NASA Washington Headquarters. Dr. Terrier is the agency's principal advisor and advocate on NASA technology policy and programs, helping plot the strategic direction of the agency's space technology program. Dr. Terrier also conducts advocacy activities with technology partners in industry and worked in the commercial aerospace sector, such as Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics and General Electric aircraft engines. Companies like Amazon and Tesla have recently joined the race for space tourism business, and European startups are gearing up for lunar or Mars mining. In Korea, private companies such as Hanhua and Korea Aerospace Industries are turning their eyes to space. The space domain, which was previously led by the government, is now emerging as a future growth engine for companies. On top of its existing exploration program, NASA supports private companies to invest in space and conduct joint projects. Now, without further ado, let's hear about the potential role of industry in future space exploration. We will now connect with Washington. Dr. Terrier, are you here with us? Hello? Everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. On behalf of the entire NASA team, I would like to thank you for the honor of being a part of the Herald Business Forum today. And I'm going to speak today um, in some detail about NASA's plans for space exploration, focusing on our, particularly on our Artemis mission, um, which is the exciting flagship mission coming up to return humans to the moon for a extended stay for living and working on the moon in a sustainable fashion, and then eventually on to Mars. But I'd like to focus also on the opportunities that are created for commercialization, both in space and the opportunities for businesses on Earth to benefit from the technologies that we develop in space. Before I begin, let me begin. Let me give you a good an overview of NASA's entire exploration uh, program with the next chart. So NASA, as you may well be is responsible for exploration of the entire universe, a domain from the surface of the Earth all the way to the extent of the observable universe, something like 24, 10 to the 24, 10 to the 26 kilometers in space, spatial coordinates, and something on the order of 14 billion years in time, temporal coordinates, if you will. And in order to do that, we use a host of capabilities ranging from human exploration, robotic exploration uh, precursors and avatars, as well as space observatories in the extreme. And one way to think of our, our the way we employ this suite of capabilities is to think of it in terms of distance or domains going out from the surface of the Earth. In general, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to get mass, uh, consumables, materials, equipment, spacecraft out of Earth's gravity. So we could put very large things in the region around the Earth, and now we're working to put further development into cislunar space around the moon and eventually onto Mars. As we go further out into the solar system, with our current technology, it becomes harder and harder to send human class missions. So we rely extensively on our robotic missions, our, our small uh, um, autonomous avatars that conduct the scouting and the prospecting in advance of human exploration. And then in the very furthest extreme, we use our space observatories where we essentially pass we wait for the information to come to us across the great distance of time and space. And in that in so doing, we're exploring the very distant past and the very furthest distances in the universe. As we understand more about that, we are able to send robots to do the preliminary prospecting, and, and eventually we send humans as the technology allows. 
So if you think about it, we have done a, in the last century, we have conquered the region just above the earth in the atmosphere. And that has transitioned from being one of primarily government experiment into one of a commercially successful endeavor. Aviation worldwide is now about $7 billion in value and an international, uh, completely commercial endeavor, um, very independent of the, the government investment. That is the same model that we want to take as we go forward. So basically, you can think of our mission as conducting, really being focused on two things. First, to extend the boundaries of each of these domains, how far we can send humans, further send um, robots out ahead of us, and look further back into time and space even with the, uh, the space observatories to see what's at the very beginning of the Earth, of the uh, universe, even at, back, back to the beginning of the Big Bang. The second most important thing that we're focused on is ensuring that as we undertake this discovery, this, this mission of exploration and discovery, that we are necessarily creating new technologies. Space is such a demanding environment that we have to create new technologies in order to be able to, to make these missions possible. And we want to ensure that those technologies have immediate application as much as possible right here on Earth in solving problems that are similar challenges here on Earth, ranging from everything from clean drinking water to agriculture uh, to, you know, microelectronics, communications, etc. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the benefit we've already seen in the past. And I want to focus the rest of my talk now. And as we as we go forward in our exploration mission, the opportunity that we're trying to create for that technology to have both create industry, industry and commercial opportunities in space and have impact on creating new industries and new opportunities here on Earth. Next chart, please. So let me let me just talk about some of the, the, the steps that I just outlined and what's going on in each of those. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in the following slides in each of these areas. Today, we already have um, International Space Station on orbit. It's been in operation now for over two decades with an international crew conducting thousands of experiments that have led us to discoveries that help us to understand how to support human life and our spacecraft in space for long durations, but more importantly, have also provided us with a host of medical, combustion, um, materials, structures, electronics technologies that we have been able to apply here on Earth. Everything from advanced clean solar power, the most advanced power systems around the space station, to recyclable water and, and uh, consumables that we do, that we have pioneered on the space station and now have application on Earth to agricultural um, applications as we learn to grow crops in space and we develop new technologies around fertilizer and hydroponics and, and how to apply those to the conditions on Earth as well as how to keep the human system, the astronauts healthy in a very, very austere, very challenging environment in space in microgravity, in a radiation environment many countermeasures that we've developed and many medical treatments that we've developed, miniaturized and remote medical technologies have found their application back on Earth. So we've already used the International Space Station now to learn a lot about operating in space for a long term. The other thing that we're doing in low Earth orbit, as we talk, as we talk about that region close to the Earth where the International Space Station orbits, is we're commercializing that area. Much as I described that we're commercialized We've commercialized aviation in the last century. We're moving to a more commercial model, and I'll talk more about that in the following slides. Moving that, that sphere of operation in the low Earth orbit more to a commercial model and involving as many commercial providers around the world. Of course, the International Space Station is, is an international endeavor involving many part, over 15 partner countries um, founding the International Space Station team originally, and that has ex continued to expand. That is a model that we want to take forward as we move on to the Artemis lunar missions, which I'll describe in detail in the coming slides. So again, the Artemis mission is our return to the moon and taking with us all that we've learned in the International Space Station, 
both in international participation and commercial opportunities that we've developed in the International Space Station. We'll take those lessons forward as we develop the Artemis missions. And as I said, in the meantime, we have several amazing robotic missions that are explore and have explored every planet on our solar system. Today, we have the Perseverance rover uh, just this weekend taking the first core samples of the Martian soil that will be returned to Earth eventually for examinations of a historic achievement. And we will continue to explore the planets of our solar system with exciting missions in the future. Looking for signs of life, an opportunity um, where life may exist elsewhere in the solar system and where the conditions for us to set up human habitation exist on those planets and icy moons of our outer planets. And all of this is underpinned by the technologies that we develop in, in advanced technologies necessary for propulsion and, and um, life support and communication and all the technologies that we need to enable these missions to be successful. And again, the, 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 I will keep emphasizing the benefit is twofold. One, we're constructing these missions in a way that allow maximum opportunity for commercial companies around the world, our international partners, to find opportunities to participate and contribute to Artemis and our other missions in space. And we're also focused on ensuring that those technologies feed back to Earth in applications that provide tangible benefit to the quality of life here on Earth and provide commercial opportunities for business on Earth. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit more about the International Space Station, because as I just said, it kind of provides us with a good model of how we intend to proceed as we go forward. What we've learned over the last two decades in the International Space Station is not, not only about some of the technologies, the um, human system challenges that we've learned to overcome, but how to, how to do this in an international and collaborative way involving industry and commercial participation. And that is a foundational model that we are using as we proceed forward with the Artemis program. We're looking to expand on that model. Just to give you a little bit more background, the International Space Station is about 400,000 kilogram uh, vehicle, about 100 meters in size. It's been, it's traveling at about almost eight kilometers per second in orbit, orbiting at Earth every 90 minutes. Um, it is certainly one of the most impressive engineering achievement of humankind ever. And it has been, um, as I said, not just a scientific and technology, a technical achievement, but it's also been an achievement of international collaboration and diplomacy. So this is just a, an amazing catalyst for science, technology, human innovation, and it's provided us with many breakthroughs that are not possible here on Earth. I'll just give a couple examples to expand on what I said earlier. One of the challenges, you know, we, we have the challenge of operating in a space environment. It's the most challenging, most austere environment. You, are, you know, we have to utilize the resources that we have on orbit because you can't just obviously go outside and, and buy new air and new, new food and new water. So we're required to develop the technology to be able to recycle and reclaim all the water that we consume on the station, whether it's drinking water, um, whether it's uh, wash water, uh, even perspiration and recycle that wastewater into into consumable water so we can continue to to use those same thing with the air to continue to replenish the air supply so that we have um cons you know healthy consumable air scrub out the carbon dioxide create new oxygen and we do that on a continuous basis we also have to provide power so we have the most advanced solar clean renewable power systems on the international space station uh, it's completely self-contained those are just some of the technologies that we've had to invest in. And as I said, those have direct application, as you can imagine, to many of the challenges that we're facing on Earth with renewable resources and, uh, and sustainable living in all aspects. Next chart, please. So let me move now and talk more about the Artemis program. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo in, in Greek mythology, so it is a fitting successor to the Apollo Apollo program. The most important thing to understand about the Artemis program that differs from Apollo 
Of course, many of my generation were, were inspired by the Apollo missions um, all around the world. Many of us were inspired by those missions in the 60s and 70s. Those were missions that took people to the, earth, to the moon where they carried with them all the consumables that they needed, more like a camping trip. Uh, and those missions were conducted initially just for a few hours on the surface. And by the last mission, they spent almost two days on the surface. But they carried with them all the, all the materials that they needed, all the oxygen and food and water, et cetera, that they needed um, to conduct the mission. The important thing about what we're doing in Artemis is we're now taking the model of long duration, sustained presence uh, that we have pioneered on the International Space Station, and we're taking that to a planetary surface in preparation for further missions onto Mars and other planets in the solar system. So necessarily, we're going to, we cannot bring with us, for the reason that I mentioned before, it is simply prohibitive to take all the mass and materials that we need with us for a very long duration, sustained stay. So we need to learn how to build and work um, from the environment on the surface of the moon, how to, how to create all the consumables we need from the resources on the moon. And that is a huge challenge and a huge step forward that, we, that will differentiate this from the Apollo mission. And it is a critical piece that we need for missions to Mars and other destinations where the travel time is up to nine months and we may stay on the surface for, for a year or more. So it is absolutely essential that we learn how to live and sustain ourselves from the material that we find in the environment on the surface. And so Artemis is, a, if you will, a pathfinder, um, has its own set of missions and scientific endeavors on the moon, but is a pathfinder for all planetary exploration to come with the idea of sustainable um, living and working, living off the land as the kind of key goal that differentiates sort of from previous human missions. Next slide, please. So let me tell you um, a little bit about the Artemis program. For those of you who may not be familiar, the architecture differs in, because of the reasons I just described. Architecture will differ somewhat from our previous um, Apollo architectures. In that, in the Apollo model, because we were only going for a short period, we went directly to low or lunar orbit with the Saturn V spacecraft and the Apollo spacecraft. And then we went down to the surface with the lunar lander for a short period, back up and rendezvoused with the Apollo and returned home to Earth. We intend to stay and work and live on the moon for long periods. So a, part, and a very essential part of the architecture that we're creating is what we call the gateway. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. But it will be an orbiting laboratory, an orbiting command post around the moon that provides us with a staging point for missions down to the surface as, as well as eventually a staying post for missions onto Mars and further destinations in the solar system. So we have several components of the, the vehicle that I'll go into more in, a, in the next slides. We have a, a large launch vehicle, the largest ever designed by humans that will take the um, spacecraft onto the to lunar orbit. And we'll be going into a, a very special orbit in the Lagrange region around the moon where we will rendezvous with that gateway, that space station command post. And then we'll have a separate lunar lander system that will take the astronauts down to the surface. This will occur in several stages. Artemis 1 will be the first human spacecraft to the moon, and that will occur in the next couple of years. We're expecting to have the first human spacecraft test within a year or so of an integrated vehicle. The um, Orion spacecraft itself has already flown. Um, into deep space and successfully returned to Earth. We're now going to stack it, and it is in, it's being stacked right now onto the, onto the launch vehicle for preparing for its first flight to the moon. It'll be then followed by the first human missions in Artemis II in a couple years. And then finally, with the Artemis III, where we will actually rendezvous with this lunar gateway and take crews down to the surface of the moon. So... We have many, many pieces of this architecture are already in place. And I'll talk a little bit more about on the surface, there are many pieces of architecture that also need to be, do need to be put in place, yeah, some ahead of human landing. We'll, we'll need, of course, habitats, rovers, power systems, um, the, the systems that convert lunar regolith into materials we need, the systems that convert 
water on the moon into oxygen and, and hydrogen for rocket fuel. And so we have targeted the south pole of the moon as our, our key target site now that we have had prospectors, robots, robotic spacecraft on the moon have identified billions of tons of ice in craters on the south pole of the moon. So we know where that resource is and we can go ahead and extract that resource and use it for our consumables. In the meantime, we have a series of smaller robots that are already beginning their, their work to do advanced prospecting, to outline exact, to really identify and um, characterize those resources and characterize the landing sites in something called a CLIPS program, which I'm happy to say we are in negotiations with um, Korea industry and, and participation from many international partners, including, including Korea, to provide uh, technology and instruments for those space craft. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit about the major elements of the architecture, and then I will get back to the, the, the clips, the robotic precursor vehicles on the surface. So these are three of the major components of the Artemis um, architecture. The, the, big, the first picture on the lower left, the large orange structure is the, um, the rocket that will take the, the humans to the moon. It is called the SLS, the Space Launch System. It is over 350 feet tall. It, um, again, will have about 1 million pounds of thrust. It will be the largest vehicle, larger than the Saturn V, more powerful than the Saturn V ever built by humanity. Uh, um, that vehicle, as I said, is currently has undergone uh, full stage firing, test firing. It is now being stacked. The white portion on the very top of that vehicle is the actual crew system, which consists of the Orion spacecraft and its service module. The service module is being developed by the European Space Agency in our continued partnership, again, characterizing the, the commercial and, and, and international nature of this mission. Right above that, on the left-hand side of the uh, left upper quadrant of this picture is the gateway. Uh, if you imagine this as a small space station, a command post, a rendezvous point that we will use to con conduct our missions where we'll, the crew will rendezvous with that spacecraft and then dock there and meet up with the landers that will take them down to the surface. We'll also be a staging post for other systems that go down to the surface. And eventually it may be a staging post and refueling post, if you will, almost a port in space, a gateway for missions that, that will go on further into the solar system. Our long-term view is to develop capabilities which will allow us to not just provide consumables, fuel, oxygen, um, water, and so on fr from the surface of the moon for the operations on the moon, but perhaps to bring those, those consumables up to the gateway and have that as a refueling post for missions that, are, that can stop over for their refuel, uh, replenish consumables on the way to deep space mission. On the upper right is the final major section of the architecture, the human landing system. So again, the Ryan spacecraft will meet up at the gateway at that node in lunar orbit, in a high lunar orbit, with a spacecraft that's designed specifically to be a reusable system to take astronauts down to the surface and back up from the surface to the gateway where they would meet up with the Orion spacecraft and return home to Earth. Importantly, that lunar uh, human landing system is being sourced as a commercial uh, um, procurement, meaning we are relying on industry to provide that capability. And I'll talk a little bit about more about how that model has proved so successful and economically um, so very, very efficient for us in the International Space Station crew and cargo supply. So we're using, again, taking those lessons and carrying them forward into the Artemis mission as an essential part of the way we're structuring this architecture to, to really maximize the opportunity for international and commercial participation, both in the design of the vehicles and hopefully eventually in the, in, the, in the participation in surface operations and deep space operations. Next chart, please. 
So the gateway itself, this is just an exploded view of the gateway spacecraft, just to give you an idea of the partners that are already signed on. Um, as you can see, there are many of the partners that are currently our, our um, founding partners on the International Space Station, including JAXA and ESA, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, and so on. But we're expanding that to include new um, commercial providers and looking for opportunities to expand our international partnerships, not just on the gateway, but again, on the entire Artemis architecture and program with more international participants. We're very much paying attention to the developments that are occurring around the world in, um, in, in, in the, the burgeoning um, both commercial, uh, private sector space industry, and also in government space industry in countries like Korea, where we see great opportunity for further collaboration and, and continuing our collaborative work uh, to even further to be an integral part of the Artemis architecture. Next chart, please. So let me back up a minute and talk about the, I mentioned that what we call CLIPS for short, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. So before we even begin the first human missions on the surface of the moon, we have partnered with a host of commercial companies to provide small scale, non-human rated, but smaller scale spacecraft that will, that will do the prospecting on the surface. I mentioned that we have identified the resources that we want to exploit on the surface of the moon. Um, literally billions of tons of ice has been found on the South Pole, which makes it a very attractive target. And that's where our first landings and potentially um, base will be placed on the South Pole because we can take that ice, um, we can extract that ice from, from the um, craters, we can break it into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen provides us with fuel to refuel our spacecraft. The oxygen, of course, can be used for oxidizers on the spacecraft as well as for breathing oxygen for the crew, of course, drinking water. We're also conducting a host of experiments that will actually use the, the, both the, the lunar, lunar regolith or the soil, if you will, to, to create materials that we need for, for habitation, for building habitats. And as much as possible, learning again how to utilize all the materials we find on the surface of the moon to create the living environment and the consumables that we need. And you see here on this chart, uh, a host of private sector companies that have been um, in, that are currently involved in the, the commercial lunar payload services program and they have missions that are starting as early as um, next year to land these rovers and, and small payloads on the surface of the moon that will be essentially prospecting to identify and, and, and characterize the location of the resources we need in detail so that we when we land humans we know exactly where we need to go and, and we'll also use these Many of these have um, scale models of the, the, the technologies and the systems that we need to process the water, to process the lunar soil, into, and they will be conducting, um, and we are conducting uh, technology demonstrations of those at a small scale before we bring the human class systems to the moon. Next one. So let me, uh, and, I, and again, I want to I want to say how excited we are while we're on the subject of commercial uh, lunar payloads that we're in negotiation with uh, several entities in Korea, and we look forward to the participation and the excellent technology contribution that uh, Korea can make, particularly to those payloads in the very near future. Within again, within we're talking within a year, and then eventually how we can expand that to the entire Artemis architecture over the next several years. And I, I want to I want to pause for a moment and emphasize that this is we anticipate the commercialization of space as we develop this architecture. And as I, I have repeated several times, we're trying to do this in the way that is the most flexible to allow for international and commercial participation. Today, the commercial value, the value of the space enterprise is on the order, depending on who you ask or who does the survey, it's on the order of about. $500 billion of the value of space enterprise today. We expect that to grow to trillions in the coming decades. And um, we again want to construct this architecture in a way that fosters and invites and cultivates 
and creates the, uh, the conditions for the success of as much commercial participation, both to support our missions and perhaps independent commercial missions, uh, everything raising, ra ranging from tourism to potentially mining operations to, to perhaps commercial providing of uh, fuel and, and resources for government and other missions um, from the lunar surface and further destinations. So a great model to talk about to illustrate where we have enjoyed great success is the commercial cargo and crew program. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, in the International Space Station, we undertook the, uh, a very proactive effort starting uh, several years ago to transition from NASA-led um, supply of the International Space Station with NASA um, government spacecraft, but to, to transition that over to a commercial procurement model where we procure those services, both first with, with cargo transport to the International Space Station, and we've had remarkable success with several companies, and we have now, in just the last year, continued to expand that to transition to the transportation of humans, of our astronauts, through commercial companies like SpaceX and Boeing that will provide that transportation system to the International Space Station. We've had a couple very successful flights by SpaceX, have the Boeing flight coming up next, and we again are looking to grow that opportunity for um, a commercial business in space, this one being transportation of crew and cargo. As I said, many more to follow. Next, please. So talking about the resupply services um, in particular, we have, we have uh, several partners that we're working with, and they include the SpaceX Cargo Dragon, which has been now flying successfully several, for several years and provided remarkable, um, both, as both um, efficient and safe transportation of cargo up to the space station, as well as returning cargo um, down mass from the space station. And as I said, that is the foundation for the crew cargo, the crew dragon vehicle, which uh, we're now beginning operations in. We also have Northrop Grumman, the Cygnus vehicle that has been many years provided, um, very reliable transportation of cargo to the International Space Station. And we're also working with Sierra Nevada in developing the Dream Tracer as an, another potential uh, provider of commercial resupply services. So this is a tried and true model where we're encouraging the development of, of international or, and, uh, I'm sorry, of commercial uh, providers to be able to support operations on the space station. And this, again, forms a really great model for further development in, in the Artemis architecture of our commercial partnerships. Next one, please. So let me, let me just sum that up by saying that it is very important to understand that if, if you, if, when we talk about the Artemis program, we obviously are talking about scientific and technology uh, um, exploration of the solar system and, and placing humans on the moon for extended stays, living, working, doing scientific experiments, um, again, utilizing the, the, the resources on the surface, learning how to live in a microgravity environment on a, on a foreign on a planet so that we can use those technologies to move out to Mars and other planets in the solar system. So this is an integral part of our stepwise progress for human exploration and for exploration of the solar system. But the, the way we're conducting that, the way we have structured the architecture is all about encouraging the development of commercial opportunities to encourage further participation of, of international partnerships and allies in joining us, joining NASA, the United States, in an international collaborative exploration as we go to the moon and Mars, and also to promote industry, both in the United States and in our partners around the world, to promote opportunities for industry. So I can't stress enough that this is, this is, this is what is vitally different. I would say those are the two fundamentally different uh, features of this architecture from, say, the Apollo program model, which was primarily government, U.S. government-led, primarily, um, you know, a, a, a event-led for, for landing on the surface of the moon and focused solely on that uh, technical task. 
we have this is a much broader program that's intended to provide these opportunities for commercial, international, and industrial development across the globe with our international partners. And we look forward to opening up that space economy, which, as I said, is expected to be valued in the trillions of dollars in the next in the coming decades. And we want to see our, our team in a leadership position to capitalize on that and create untold opportunities. The next chart, please. We have tried to, we have proceeded with um, creating agreements that, that codify the, the, uh, how, how we participate internationally for the peaceful exploration of deep space. We have, we have we've called those the Artemis Accords that describe how we will participate together to ensure uh, collaborative and peaceful development. And um, we've had now many, we have a large number of nations that have already signed on to that. Again, many of our international space station partners initially and expanding that list to include a growing numbers of emerging space deferring nations. Next slide, please. And I am very, very pleased to, to announce um, again to recognize that the Republic of Korea, uh, the Minister of Science uh, has, Minister Lim has signed the Artemis Accords um, on May 4th, 24th in Seoul, um, formally joining with the Artemis team. And we're so proud at NASA, the United States is so proud. Welcome to Korea as an integral member and valued partner in our team. And we look forward to working together to make this dream of Artemis a reality. And um, we think the opportunity, as I said, for, for both science and technology advancement, as well as for commercial advancement and economic opportunity is, is, is just boundless. And we're looking forward to working together to make it a reality. And if I could have the next slide. So finally, I will say, let's, let's go together. If this is the time for us to take this next step in human exploration of the solar system. For all the reasons I've just described, we have the capability, we have a purpose, that we have the, the charge to do it, and we have the responsibility. I started by saying many of my generation were inspired by the achievements of the Apollo era programs. I think it is, it is we, are, we are poised to create an even more exciting, even more dynamic opportunity in this time where we can inspire an entire new generation in the United States, in our allies like Korea and around the world to pursue science and technology, to pursue new technologies that will create not just opportunities in space, but opportunities for new businesses throughout um, industry on Earth. And um, we look forward to working together with you. And I thank you for your time and um, look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. 네, 기조 연설을 해 주신 테리어 박사님 감사드립니다. Thank you very much, Dr. Terrier. We all now have a Q&A session with Dr. Terrier. If you have any questions, please share your hand and we will deliver the microphone to you. Please raise your hands. The gentleman in the back. Thank you very much for your lecture. Well, the Korean government, as you mentioned, uh, onboarded the Artemis program. Do you have in? Uh, we have a lot of interest in other programs at NASA. Do you have any other programs that you would like to introduce other than Artemis, or any projects or programs that uh, you will see achievements soon? Thank you for the question. That's a very good question. Yes. So Artemis, we spent a lot of time talking about Artemis today, the humans pro that's kind of our flagship human spaceflight program. But as you know, we have many ongoing programs uh, that are in fact, this is this is the most exciting time in NASA's history. And that's something that is often overlooked. We have so many opportunities uh, that are just just this is the time, this is a watershed moment in our history. Among the opportunities we have is we have a host of new robotic spacecraft. As I mentioned earlier, we currently have the Perseverance rover uh, that is actually 
drilling cores and collecting samples of the Martian surface, searching for life. Uh, those samples will be cached and, and, and will be returned in a, in a follow-up mission, will be returned to Earth for examination. A really exciting mission there, a historic um, uh, first samples to be returned from Mars. We have, of course, a helicopter, Ingenuity, flying on Mars that is a part of that, exper that, that mission that's doing um, scouting over the horizon for, for the rover in advance of its, its uh, traverse of the surface. We also have on the books many um, exciting missions potentially to explore the icy moons of the outer planets with robotic precursors. Uh, that, is a, that is something we've just learned in the last um, several years with our Cassini missions and other missions that, that explored the outer planets. We found tantalizing clues that there may be conditions conducive to life on some of the moons of those outer planets. So we have in the works plans for some exciting missions that will be groundbreaking, require new instruments, a whole host of new technologies to, to measure uh, the constituents and the conditions in those outer planets. We also are in the, in the looking into deep space. We are, we are, of course, looking forward to launching this in the next few months, the James Webb Space Telescope which will have 100 times the resolution and the capability of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope, of course, has already produced more science in, in its lifetime about co the cosmology than we have had in the previous history of humanity. And the James Webb promises to eclipse that record with, with looking back to the very beginnings of time, to the beginning of the Big Bang, and also um, you know, looking into the furthest uh, reaches of the solar system. In addition, we have in our aeronautics program, I'll mention, for the first time in decades, we have three experimental airplanes flying that are, that are exploring new regimes of flight that promise to be very, very successful in, in combating some of our environmental concerns with aviation, as well as, as, well as proving that technology is needed for supersonic overland flight. So we have the uh, X-59 particularly that will fly and as well as the X-57, want to show how we can use distributed electric propulsion for new mo modes of uh, propulsion and aircraft architectures that promise uh, very you know, clean, efficient um, transportation. We also are working on uh, supersonic overland flight, building a prototype sp uh, aircraft that will fly and demonstrate how we can produce overland supersonic flight without the um, sonic boom issues that we experienced with the Concorde, and that will open a whole range of opportunities for aviation um, flying in overland routes. So there's, as I said, in addition to that, um, I mentioned we have the commercial spacecraft programs going on, uh, both in operations right now in low Earth orbit with the International Space Station, which continues to be our you know, our experimental laboratory outpost in space, um, continuously manned by crews 24-7. We continue to have that vehicle in operation and using the commercial model for resupply and, and crew transport. And we have, a, again, a growing uh, participation and partnership with commercial and industrial providers to grow that international participation into the rest of our programs across the solar system. So I think there's tremendous opportunities, obviously, um, for Korea industry as well as academia to participate in science, technology, and all across the spectrum of our work. 네, 이어서 다음 질문 받도록 하겠는데요. 질문 있으신 분들 손을 들어주시면 마이크 전달하도록 하겠습니다. Next question, please. Next question, please. Yes. Um. Can we hear the next question? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you very much for the great presentation. So Korea um, just joined the Artemis program. So your presentation was very interesting. Back in 2016, uh, Korea also pursued its lunar uh, exploration in partnership with NASA. However, when it comes to space exploration, Korea is not leading uh, the projects. Uh, when it comes to China, our neighboring country, uh, their mission is to become a space country and uh, the government invests a huge amount in space exploration and uh, universities also nurture talents in the field so in the uh, short term um, China has made um, great progress 
then uh, for Korea to really become a leader and uh, gain competitive edge in space exploration, uh, what do you think the Korean government should do in terms of investment or investment in terms of technology or nurturing talents and so forth? Thank you. That's a very, very deep question. Thank you for asking. And we, we recognize and congratulate China on its extraordinary progress. Uh, China has, of course, landed a, a rover on the far side of the moon, which is um, a, a tremendous achievement and has several um, spacecraft in orbit. Uh, we recognize the, the growing capability in China. We think it's vitally important for the United States and its allies, uh, including Korea, uh, to, to establish our space program as a collaborative program and establish our leadership in this area. I think the answer to your question, um, if I understand correctly, you know, the, the idea of Artemis is to bring together the combined capabilities of all of our international partners so that together we can be stronger and together we can lead and continue to enjoy the, um, the, the leadership in technology and science, not just, as I said, to, to ensure that we are our leaders in space and space exploration, but maybe more importantly, because these tend to drive our technology edge for many of our industries on Earth, whether it's artificial intelligence or medicine, computing, agriculture, etc. So I think it's very important that we work together as a community, where and, and we're trying to structure the Artemis program in a way where each community, each participant can contribute according to its capability. So I'll just give you a, an example would be, for example, in the International Space Station, since I've used that as a model, we have, you know, of course, with our Russian and European partners, we each contribute very large modules to the International Space Station. Uh, can, Canada, on the other hand, contributes the robotic arm, which is a vital part of the uh, space station assembly and, and operations, but it is a smaller, it, it's, a, it's a contribution that's in keeping with Canada's uh, financial commitment to, this, to, to space, but allows them to be a full participant in the entire space station program. I think that's the advantage that we can see from the Artemis Accords, is that nations with, that are both beginning their, you know, in the beginning stages of their space exploration program and technology development, as well as more advanced nations, we can all contribute together and all of us can benefit from each other. And as a community, we will see ourselves as leaders in technology and exploration. Thank you very much. Uh, due to time constraints, we will have to close the Q&A session. Thank you very much, despite the time difference, uh, with your great lecture and Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now. Let's connect with Professor Janice Eberly of Finance, Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University for the second keynote speech. Professor Eberly is former chair of the finance department under the Obama administration and was the chief economist at the Treasury. The title of the presentation is The Economy Ahead and the Biden Infrastructure Plan. Hello, Professor. Very nice to see you. You have 40 minutes from now on. Thank you very much. I the opportunity to join you today. It's the evening in Chicago, um, and I'm, I'm pleased to be part of the Herald Business Forum today. The topic um, that I would like to discuss and was invited to present is on the economy ahead and the Biden infrastructure plan. Um, it's actually quite appropriate following the presentation on NASA by Dr. Terrier to take some of the same ideas but bring them back to earth uh, literally and but keep the same forward looking and investment uh, perspective as we think about infrastructure. As an economist and as a policymaker, I've always been puzzled when it's difficult to move forward with infrastructure projects in the sense that they invest in the economy ahead, they 
provide capability to the business sector. They invest in people. They often address crises and, and difficulties. Um, and, and they provide visible evidence to the legislators of the work that they are doing in the public sector um, that provides tangible benefits to the, the rest of the economy and to their constituents. But nonetheless, it can be very difficult to implement infrastructure. Um, and the, the Biden administration has nonetheless put forward um, a very ambitious plan. And so what I'd like to do today is talk to you about what that is included in that plan, um, as well as how what's been left out and, and how the, the outlook appears for a passage um, of this ambitious project. So it has two parts, um, and the first, and, and the two taken together are, are the largest infrastructure proposal in many decades in the US. The bipartisan bill, the first piece, has passed the Senate, and then there's a second larger bill which is intended to pass through the, the reconciliation process or the budget process that always begins in the House of Representatives. The outlook is unclear. Both of these are still in the, in the legislative process, um, but there's been much debate and much consideration already. So I'd like to explain to you first what's different about these proposals because they, they are um, both in their, in their ambition and in their content different than what we've seen in the past and why we're seeing these proposals coming through now. So first, to give you a sense of the Senate bill, the Senate bill was, was passed. Um, it still would need to pass the House or at least reach an agreement with the House and then go to the president uh, for his signature. It's in total a trillion dollar expenditure on infrastructure, but it's usually referred to as $550 billion because that's the amount of new spending. The first four categories here, they, they list what's included in this $550 billion of new spending. And the first four categories are focused on transportation, very traditional physical capital uh, investments, including roads and bridges, rail and freight expenditures, public transit and ports and airports. These are classic um, and, and uh, investments in infrastructure which have been neglected um, over the past few decades um, with a new twist which is an emphasis on responding to climate change and putting in place a more resilient transportation infrastructure. Now the next categories that are included in the bill are a little um, either different or, or twists on traditional physical infrastructure. Um, the first is energy infrastructure, um, drinking water, so clean water uh, infrastructure, including replacing lead piping um, that exists in many older cities. Um, resilience. Uh, we're starting to move into, into new concerns here where um, there's funding for responding um, to uh, challenges to the resilience of uh, water systems coming from um, crypto and, and, online, um, and online threats. There's a small amount, um, much less than was originally proposed for electric vehicles, which has two main components. One is a national charging network, uh, and the other is electric buses um, to be part of the public transportation system. And then the last category really moves into um, the, the newer era of infrastructure, which is thinking about broadband. And of course, that, that's not new. That's how we're all communicating with, with each other right now. Um, but 13% of households in the United States do not have access to high-speed internet. Uh, so there's funding to provide both the network capability to broaden uh, access to broadband and also educational capabilities. So this is the, the crux of the, of the Senate bill. 
And when you look at that, um, it seems large. And let me show you that indeed um, it really is. This chart shows overall infrastructure spending by the federal government uh, in the US uh, over time as a share of GDP. And in the last few decades, it's been relatively flat around 1% of GDP. It spiked up with the stimulus provisions, the additional fiscal spending um, associated with the COVID pandemic, and then was slated to return to a similar number around 0.7% of GDP. And if the bipartisan bill were to pass, you would see this orange uh, line come to, uh, come to pass and return spending above 1% uh, of GDP. So it's a, the bipartisan bill, the Senate bill alone is enough to make a significant uh, difference and return in annual infrastructure spending to numbers more like the historically high levels. And this bill spends out over five years. So it's $550 billion over five years. So um, $110 billion per year. So it's a substantial investment in, in physical infrastructure. Now, comparing across countries is another way to get a sense of how large this infrastructure bill is. Um, you see the U.S., this includes both private and public infrastructure. So this is a slightly not larger number than the one that we just saw, um, is projected or had been without this bill to be about one and a half percent of GDP. So if the bill adds about a half a percent of GDP, um, you'd have the U.S. spending out here. It's more like the, the middle of, of the pack and increasing overall spending, um, at least for this five years, by about uh, one third, by about 33%. Comparing to other countries, of course, Korea um, is here with about double the spending on infrastructure that the U.S. has. And actually, the, this comparison makes clear um, what you see in a broad pattern across countries is that for economies like the U.S. and, and Western Europe, the, the government commitment to infrastructure has actually declined over time. So the percentage increase in the government capital stock uh, has been falling, whereas in emerging and uh, developing economies, that share has been, uh, has been either stable or rising. So the countries that have made the largest commitment to growing their public infrastructure um, are the economies that are also growing more quickly on the world stage. Oh, when you look outside just the physical capital infrastructure um, on which the in which the U.S. is investing, um, the, the physical capital infrastructure we were just talking about is about half of total investment spending um, by the federal government in the U.S. So that's this part, the dark part on the right of the chart. But there's other investment, which is also quite important. And this is in another part of the proposed legislation that I'll, I'll discuss more uh, about in a moment. Um, but it's currently about half of federal government investment, which is on R&D or research and development and education and training. And as we look to the economy of the future, which is why I, I call this talk the, the economy ahead uh, and infrastructure structure, these parts are also very important. Uh, and I'll return to, to discussing those momentarily, but they are a big part of the budget in addition to the, the traditional physical capital. But this has been declining over time. So I, I noted that infrastructure investment had been pretty, had been fairly flat. And as a share of GDP, it's been um, overall government investment has been declining over a very long period of time. This goes back to the 1950s. Uh, and you see this flattening out. And when you take away um, what's called consumption of fixed capital or, or just depreciation, so the wear and tear on the capital stock, net government investment is actually very small. Um, so that is why when you look at the overall public sector capital stock, you see either flat or declining because these levels of investment have been falling. 
So that's part of what this infrastructure plan is responding to, is a long trend over many decades of reduced investment in public sector capital and infrastructure. And so there's a, a, a strong sense that there's a need to not only reverse this trend on physical capital, but to think about these other types of investments, such as uh, research and development and education that are such a crucial part of the economy that is ahead of us. So government fixed assets taken all together, you see this downward trend. And the, and the part that I'm going to very much emphasize um, and is also emphasized in the new legislation is what appears to be this very small part on the top, which is intellectual property projects. So most of the other capital that's here is highways and streets, educational buildings, healthcare buildings, equipment, um, but intellectual property, which is crucial in, private, in the private sector, uh, and, and I will discuss more about that, is, is actually a very small part of government fixed assets. So a question when you look at these trends and see the slow diminution, this slow decline in investment in infrastructure over time, is why does it seem so hard to invest in the public sector? The benefits seem attractive to legislators. Um, they're broadly supported in the public. When you have public opinion polls, the public very much supports uh, investment in infrastructure of, of many kinds, very supportive of educational investment. However, um, when economists look at, at, uh, inv at investment in infrastructure, there are understandable reasons why it can be so hard um, to bring this investment to fruition. Um, the first, and this term, this is economist term, the elasticity of substitution is high. Um, what that means is that it's very easy to substitute um, investment in infrastructure over time. And the reason for that is because this is very long lived capital. So when you put in place roads and bridges and, and airports, they'll be in place for a very long period of time. They'll last for decades. So whether you do replacement investment this year or next year, doesn't appear to be an, and make an urgent difference in the services that are being provided by that infrastructure. So as long as the capital is in place and it's still functioning, then from one year to the next, there's, there's less urgency about making additional investments or making replacements uh, immediately. So that's what it means for the elasticity of substitution to be high. That is, it's easy to, it's easy to delay, it's easy to substitute um, that infrastructure investment from one year to the next and put it off. And from a political perspective, there are always urgent priorities. There's always something very immediate that needs to happen. Um, and when budgets are constrained, those urgent priorities tend to take uh, precedence over investment in infrastructure, which has a long life, and that investment, so it's thought, can wait until tomorrow or can wait until the next budget cycle. Now, what might get investment to speed up? What might make um, policymakers accelerate investment in infrastructure? Well, often there's a, a sense of urgency around expenditures when the economy slows down. Uh, for example, during the financial crisis, when I was working at the treasury, there was an immense sense of urgency to, to act quickly because the economy was uh, suffering so much and, and unemployment was very high. And there was a sense of, of the need for critical action. What we knew then and, and what we discovered especially over time is the the reminder that it's difficult to deploy infrastructure spending to meet that kind of urgent fast need so in a recession which might last a year um, or you know potentially longer but if people are out of work now job creation is an urgent priority it's difficult to deploy infrastructure projects so quickly that jobs are created immediately. 
Um, so infrastructure can be ill-suited to fiscal stimulus because it is slow to build. It takes a long time to develop those projects. And even if they're ready, you still need to deploy them and they're subject to what time of the year it is. Um, for example, it's difficult to do infrastructure projects, say roads and bridges in the winter in much of the United States. So you have to, you have to wait until a more fortuitous time. So the way that President Obama described this several years after the financial crisis was that there's no such thing as a shovel-ready uh, infrastructure project. So it was very frustrating because the, the funds were available, but it was difficult to put those projects into, into rapid deployment. So those two together lead to the... the uh, eventuality that infrastructure investment needs to be made during normal times. It needs to be a regular part of government priorities. But that requires that leaders come together to provide support for both a broad composition of infrastructure investment and, and a high level. The reason for that is that when, if you're trying to put together an infrastructure package, it's usually geographically quite dispersed. So different parts of the country will have different priorities, different legislators will have different priorities. So in order to put together broad-based support for an infrastructure package, um, you need to provide what I've called on this slide, the need to go big, to provide something for many different constituencies. But when you go big, it also means that projects, uh, the whole package becomes expensive. Uh, and then one runs into fiscal constraints. So, so without an imperative to move quickly, it can be very difficult to move forward uh, with a big infrastructure package, uh, which makes it hard to, to get started with big investment. Now, this has happened at, at times in the past, and, and it's interesting that uh, Dr. Terrier was here talking about uh, NASA because one of the big increases in um, what I've shown here is uh, R&D spending by the federal government was in the 1960s uh, for general science, space, and, and technology. And if you think about the history, this big increase in spending in the 1960s was when the, the US was literally trying to implement its moonshot uh, and increased spending dramatically. So, so there was a sense of national imperative around making this investment. Uh, and then once that imperative declined, then the spending declined as well. Um, the other large increase you see in R&D expenditure comes in the late 1990s and, and early 2000s with a big increase in expenditure on health R&D, and which could have come about for many reasons, but it certainly coincides with the, with the generational change in, in US demographics and the, the aging of the, the baby boom uh, and a large group of people who were, who were more interested in uh, health investment. And so now health investment dominates spending on, on research uh, in, the, in the federal government. So the infrastructure proposals currently in place are summarized in uh, this graphic, uh, which uh, the New York Times put out when the, when the bill was first passed, which I think nicely captures in a graphic the list of infrastructure uh, spending items that I had in that first chart. So in that chart, um, I showed you the spending on roads and bridges, railways, uh, airports, public transit. So it, it was all listed there, these, these bright uh, colored blocks. And it, it's all of these are in that 550, they add up to this $550 billion uh, infrastructure plan. Now, what's and, and you see transportation is well represented here, power and water infrastructure is well represented here. Um, so this is a very traditional um, and, and historically quite relevant set of hard infrastructure priorities. And the parts that are shaded out here 
are the other parts of the original Biden infrastructure proposal, um, which I'll show here. And, and you see that the original proposal had large expenditures on research and development, on schools, education, and housing, um, as well as home and community-based care, a large investment in clean energy. And some of these other proposals, say like electric vehicles, were substantially larger than what ended up in the bipartisan bill. So the bipartisan bill um, investment in electric vehicles is about 10% of what the entire uh, administration plan originally concluded, included. So the, the follow-on bill that's currently being developed, so I, I don't have a, a summary of what's in there, it's, un, it's uh, under development, um, but it will likely include many of these items that were not included um, in the bipartisan Senate bill. So what we'll be looking for in the bill to come out of the House, which it was approved for uh, 3.5 trillion in the in the as a framework in the reconciliation process um, will likely include many of these items that were zeroed out by the um, bipartisan proposal, and it's very interesting to look at these other um, items and what will likely be included in the in the House bill because these include some of the um, non-hard infrastructure and non-traditional infrastructure um, that is a priority of the administration and, and an area in which they've been being um, much more ambitious than you traditionally saw in an infrastructure bill. And in thinking about those, um, I've been doing um, research on private sector investment, which is actually quite closely related to these, this broader set of priorities that is likely to be included in the, in the House bill. So let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so in private sector investment, you actually see many of the same trends that you see in infrastructure in the following sense. So in publicly traded firms and in the national accounts in the US, the chart on the left shows the rate of investment over time going back to the 1980s. And of course there's, there's cycles in here related to the business cycles in the, in the US and global economies. And, but overall there's a downward trend. And, and this was first quite noticeable coming out of the financial crisis, that investment was very weak coming out of the global financial crisis. But when you look, you see that this is a, a much longer term trend. Um, and in the aggregate level and, and also among the very large firms uh, in, the, in the global economy. It's also evident when you look at private investment as shares of GDP. So the data that I just showed you had these lower two bars, the blue and the purple, which show investment in equipment and structures as a share of GDP. So stacked together, you see this downward trend from about 13% of GDP in the 1980s to less than 10%, it's about 8% of GDP now. So there's an ov overall, when you look at investment, it's relatively flat because of the addition of this orange piece of investment, and that's intellectual property products. So I referred earlier to the new types of investment, and this is an example of it. The parts of investment in the overall economy that show the most growth and the most dynamism are these things like software and intellectual property that are uh, intangible capital. So tangible capital um, is much, is, is less robust, is declining in many sectors, but the intangible capital, the knowledge products, the software, the digital um, uh, information and communications technology capital, those are the areas of investment in the private sector uh, in which we see more growth. 
So this net private investment overall is relatively flat, um, though it's interesting and important to keep in mind that the depreciation rate of this kind of capital is also rising uh, over time because uh, capital like software and uh, intellectual property tends to depreciate more quickly than does uh, uh, residential and, and non-residential structures, for example. Now, in a, a paper we presented at the Fed's uh, Jackson Hole Conference uh, a few years ago, we showed the relationship between this decline in physical capital investment and the rise of intangible capital. So on the, the top of this chart, the vertical part of this chart, what you're seeing is the amount of of missing investment, investment in physical capital, like equipment and structures that we might have expected to see historically. And on the horizontal axis is the intangible assets. And, and each dot represents a different industry. Uh, and this is from uh, firm level data grouped into industries. So the, the parts of the private sector where you see the biggest declines in investment, so the, the most missing capital, is where we have the largest amount of intangible assets. So there's a shift going on in industries where we're shifting the most toward intellectual property and software and information and communications technology, we're seeing the biggest shift away from physical capital. Um, and this is especially evident um, in industries like healthcare and high tech, where what this chart is showing is how much of that investment gap is explained by intangibles. So the intangible valuation is the largest and has grown the most in industries like high tech uh, and healthcare, which are very dynamic and, and have a lot of innovation and high valuations. So in the private sector, what these data show is that there's a shifting uh, occurring from tangible capital to intangible capital. And the largest growth is in cap types of capital like equipment and software and research and development. So connecting this back to infrastructure, so this is what we're seeing in the private sector. What is the infrastructure that supports an economy where equipment and software and research and development are engines of growth and are engines of, of resilience, as I'll discuss in a moment. So this type of an economy needs skills, it needs education, it needs connectivity like we're experiencing now, and of course also research and development. So as an example of what I mean by this and, and how this has played out in the economy, we just talk briefly about how this has played out in the uh, COVID-19 shock. Um, it's, a, of course, a particularly distressing and, and difficult time for the global economy, um, but it's also revealed um, some areas of resilience uh, in, in parts of the economy. So this shows data across countries where the, the red bars show the dramatic declines in GDP that occurred right when the pandemic first struck. So in the second quarter of 2020, and there were horrific both loss of life and declines in, in economic uh, output and, and power on the UK data, I'll, I'll just give as an example, where actual output fell by 21% just from the first quarter to the second quarter. Um, you see similar declines in other countries. The US um, output declined 9% from the first quarter to the, to the second quarter. And what we asked in, in this research was how much of that is due to the decline in output in the business sector? And it turns out that actually more than all of it 
is from the business sector. That is, if you look at the UK and say, how much did labor decline in the business sector? How much did capital decline in the business sector? You would have expected output to fall 33%. So as horrific as the impact of the pandemic was, there was a buffer offered and occurring from outside the business sector, um, specifically because so many employees were able to pivot and to work from home. So they were not relying on working in the business sector, literally on premises. Many workers were able to pivot uh, and to work from home. Now, not in every sector, of course. So in the UK data, you can look across industries and see that, for example, in the accommodation and food sector, so hotels and restaurants, 80% of the workers were furloughed. So 80% of employees were not able to work, they were simply at home. Um, whereas 20% uh, in yellow here were able to work from home. In contrast, in other industries where workers were better able to pivot to work from home just because of the, the characteristics, the nature of the industry, um, very few workers were furloughed, only about 15%, and almost 80% of workers were able to work from home in information and communications. Um, you see similar numbers in other um, service areas, like especially high tech, like professional and scientific services, but also in finance, real estate, um, and other administrative services. So what this tells us is that as, as catastrophic, as large as it was, the collapse in output could have been much worse, but instead workers were either working from home um, but they were also able to use their home capital and technologies that they already had available to them. Um, so we estimate that this ability to pivot, to work from home and to use the kind of technology that we're working now to connect together and to create a new workspace actually added from eight to 10% of GDP um, across this group of countries at the depth um, at the, of the pandemic when it first struck in the second quarter. And this ability to work from home, I mentioned information and communications, is very highly correlated, as you can see here, with the presence of intangible capital. So what enabled the workers and the labor in information and communications and professional and scientific uh, services to be able to continue to work and to do their work from a remote location was the existing investments, this existing infrastructure in intangible capital. So things like uh, information and communications technology, software, and so on. So this has important implications for work in the future. Um, there's a long conversation and, and I think a long future discussion to be had about how you know, our work from home is not a new phenomenon. Artisanal production is the history of many industries, um, but the industrial revolution took us to, um, to the workplace, to a centralized workplace. So a question that, that arises now is whether we'll reverse again and, and allow many workers and employees to work from home. But in the meantime, what's worth recognizing is how quickly this pivot to remote work was able to happen. And, and my point here is, is not that, there will, that the new economy is all about working from home. The point is that there was a lot of personal capital was available for use in the business sector. Uber and Airbnb are essentially doing the same thing with existing capital. And because this, this infrastructure was already available, then it, we could pivot very quickly when the pandemic unexpectedly struck and we needed this alternative workplace to be available immediately. And that required broadband, the internet, these digital complements like conferencing um, to recreate 
this workplace. So from an infrastructure per perspective, I wanted to close with is to ask, what kind of infrastructure do we need for this new economy? Of course, we need transportation and we need uh, to pivot to more electric vehicles and, and transit that, that respects the climate change that we're confronting. But there's also a new economy confronting us that requires more research and development, that requires housing and, and schools and education, and of course, broadband in order to provide this, this connectivity. So as we move forward, what the, the next step in the infrastructure um, plan and overall plan has in mind is to add this other piece of capital, this part that's looking more to the future needs of the economy to the overall infrastructure package. So not only catching up on the infrastructure that we've neglected, but also moving the infrastructure to the economy that we face in the future. We're already seeing much of this investment. This is why we were able to, to pivot so quickly in, in 2020. Um, I've highlighted Korea here as having not only high labor productivity growth, but also a substantial growth in intangible assets in addition to um, physical capital and, and hence high TFP growth. But other countries you see are, are also investing heavily in intangible assets. And in some cases, like the US, investing more in intangibles than they are in tangible capital. Um, Finland is remarkable in having a, a large amount of intangible capital. So many countries are already moving in this direction and you see the contribution to growth. So this is from a, a, a research paper that showed the contributions in Korea to um, overall growth in gross value added, so growth in output coming from both tangible capital and almost as much coming from in investments in intangible capital and uh, information and communications technology. So this shows the growth in the market economy and this shows the growth in the service economy where you see a similar pattern of investment in tangible capital, but also significant growth in intangible capital. So it, it's not as if we're thinking of this new economy as something that's distant and, and in the distant future and, and we'll prepare for it as we get there. This economy is here now. And we already have uh, much, some of the capital in place, but there's, there's clear growth happening here. And, and that's what the private sector is taking advantage of. The private sector is investing and growing, and, and this is the infrastructure uh, to support it. So let me just make one remark about how this is paid for. I've focused on the benefits of infrastructure, um, but of course it's costly to build the physical capital as well as the um, intangible capital. Traditionally in the US, much of the infrastructure was paid for either by taxes on gasoline or by revenue from uh, energy extraction in many of the energy intensive states. So that's a declining source of revenue over time. Um, the Senate bill is fairly creative in looking for revenue sources. For example, they've added in uh, a tax on cryptocurrencies, which was controversial, but it's a, it's a novel revenue source. Um, the other focus, of course, should be on efficiency in public infrastructure. So as we have these new technologies, um, we should be able to uh, respect and, and utilize public resources uh, in the most efficient way possible. So to wrap up, is there a new sense of urgency now? I, I started off by emphasizing that it has always been easy to delay infrastructure. Uh, and nonetheless, the Biden administration um, and the, the bipartisan Senate group have taken an ambitious approach to trying to put together a, a large and, and forward-looking package. The question is whether there is a sense of urgency now. Um, there may be. Climate change 
um, is accelerating the need for more investment in physical infrastructure as we have increasingly frequent and also costly weather events. Um, one of the pictures that I had on my first slide was flooding. Um, you might, if you know US geography, you might have thought this was Louisiana, but this is last week in New Jersey. Uh, and so, the, so this brings a sense of urgency to these new investments. And, you know, as, as you can see from these kind of events, we're no longer talking about small depreciation at the margin in order to have the infrastructure that addresses climate change. Um, this is not infrastructure that you fix by putting on a, a new layer of pavement. This is infrastructure that you make resilient to climate change by having a whole capital replacement um, because of obsolescence. Um, so the, the small change, small delay argument no longer holds when you have large changes in the capital stock. And the last piece um, on which I'm not an expert, but I certainly see happening, um, is that there's more political urgency. There's a, a short time to act while reconciliation is a possibility for the administration to use this budget approach, um, but it requires a great de degree of, of delicacy to hold the majority together um, to support such an ambitious project. So I think there will be a lot of work both on the um, infrastructure, but also on the diplomacy of keeping the project together. So I thank you for the invitation to uh, join you today and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you about these important topics. 네, 기조 연설 잘 들었습니다. 시차... Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much, Professor. Despite the time difference, we will now have a short break until 10.20, and I will see you back at 10.20 Korea time. Thank you. Uh, we will now uh, kickstart speech one of Herald Business Forum 2021. We will now hear about cryptocurrencies. We will connect with Professor Christian Parler of UC Berkeley, who is an expert in a wide variety of topics, including fintech, and serves as member of the steering committee for the new special study of securities market. She will give a 30-minute presentation on cryptocurrencies, new investable asset or new business model. Korea sees growing excitement around cryptocurrencies since the outbreak of COVID-19, a trend led by the younger generation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my research and um, my general thoughts about what I think is an extremely interesting and uh, new development. And I guess the question on the floor is whether or not or how we should think about cryptocurrencies. But it's useful to start right at the beginning. Uh, you may or may not have read the original white paper that was uh, presented or posted on the internet by Satoshi Nakamoto, who is an anonymous person and goes by that name. And basically what was in the white paper was a protocol that allowed people to exchange value and do so in a decentralized way without the assistance of any uh, formal financial institution, bank, or any kind of financial intermediary. Since its introduction, Bitcoin started off as being something very strange and very small. But as you can see over time, the dollar value associated with Bitcoin has risen at an absolutely astronomical rate. Part of it has been fueled by um, illicit activity, but a very small part. Part of it has been fueled by uh, people's desire to essentially have what is a new part of the economy in their portfolios. Okay. 
But Bitcoin is just the beginning of the story. To some extent, you can think of it as um, the first proof of concept of a, a decentralized uh, value transfer system. And that was all very interesting and it's fabulous and it's lasted for as long as it has. So clearly something is working. 2015 saw something very different, which was uh, Ethereum. Ethereum is a different blockchain. And what is unusual about Ethereum is that it allows simple uh, programs to be written and to be observed publicly. You should think of the Ethereum blockchain as essentially a public computer that everyone can observe and anyone can verify. After people realize that the sort of basic computing functionality could be incorporated on a public blockchain, there have been a wide range of innovations. So recently there's been a huge discussion about central bank digital currency. Central banks realize that transferring value electronically can be done cheaper. It can be done in a way that saves on collateral. It can be done in a way that is relatively instantaneous compared to the extremely long and lagged versions that we now have. So central bank uh, digital currency is something that all countries are exploring. Uh, some countries such as China with DCEP, they've moved much, much more rapidly than other countries. But this is something that we will all see and see some version of. The other thing that we've seen um, in this space is the emergence of enterprise blockchain. So companies realize that there is a tremendous amount of power in having this shared computing ability. And they are investing, different companies are investing in providing blockchain solutions to their clients. Um, the thing that I find extremely interesting and is very unexpected and to some extent is very different than every, anything else we've seen before is what is known as decentralized finance. Decentralized finance is a set of protocols and open source computer code that typically resides on the Ethereum blockchain that basically generates um, business models, new business models, and allows investors and anyone to participate in them through buying cryptocurrencies. To give you a sense of how large this decentralized finance system is and cryptocurrencies in general outside of Bitcoin, okay, this graph shows you the market cap, so the dollar value associated with cryptocurrencies. In 2013, these were virtually non-existent, of course. Okay. By the time Ethereum started and everyone else realized what they could do with the power of the Ethereum virtual machine, who? there was a massive increase in uh, or interest in cryptocurrencies and it has just been increasing steadily till we're over basically 2 trillion US dollars worth. This is a large area of the economy and the, the existence of this area raises a few questions. So how do we, you know, wh what do we wanna know about this? Should we think about cryptocurrencies as something fundamentally economically new? Is this really different or is it just a new way of doing the old things? Irrespective of whether or not it's new or not new, what is the source of value for cryptocurrencies? You always want to know what is driving either the rev revenue or uh, value in general. So what is it? What is it behind cryptocurrencies that's driving value? 
Once you sort of understand what potentially is driving value in cryptocurrencies, the next sort of questions are, well, what kind of economic effect is it going to have? What effect will this have on the economy in general? And what are the risks? Any sort of prudent understanding of a new technology involves thinking carefully about risks. And these kinds of questions and the answers to these questions are extremely important, not just for uh, businesses, but also for individual investors. This is something that you want to think about when you're constructing your own portfolio. So what are the usual sources of value that people think about or uh, consider when it comes to cryptocurrencies? Well, the first one that always springs to people's minds, and it's because these things are called currencies, is they think that it's essentially a medium of exchange. This is a thing that I use to buy. And in that case, uh, the basis of value of the cryptocurrency is going to be how effective it is to facilitate payments and do payments and how effective it is relative to existing payment methods. That would be its source of value. If you just think of it as a new asset class, so a new type of investable asset, then the basis of value has to be whether or not it adds a benefit to your portfolio above and beyond everything that you already have in your portfolio. Does it hedge in some way? Does it allow you to speculate in some way? Does it give you new sort of macro risk factors? So these are sorts of questions that you want to know if, you want to th if you're thinking about putting crypto in your portfolio. And finally, just from a business point of view, there's the question about, well, is this something new? Does it allow new business models? And does it allow a new way of engaging with the world? Does it allow something that is economically novel? And if it is something economically novel, then the basis of value for a cryptocurrency is going to be the underlying business model um, and how tokens and coins, whatever you want to call them, how they increase the value of that business model. So those are sort of three distinct ways that you can think about sources of value for the crypto for cryptocurrencies. Oops. Well, let's think about Bitcoin as a means of payment. There are many different cryptocurrencies, but yeah, let's think about Bitcoin because it was the the earliest one. By construction because it's on a blockchain, Bitcoin processes transactions in blocks and each block has a fixed capacity. There's a time between blocks and there has to be a time between blocks because that's what essentially gives incentives to make the system work well. So this is a feature, not a bug. The implication of that is that Bitcoin processes transactions pretty slowly, so about seven per second. If you compare that to something like VisaNet, which is the backbone of the Visa system, they can process 24,000 transactions per second. So in terms of a, a, a means of payment, all these blockchain related solutions are pretty inefficient compared to what we have now. In addition, one of the ways in which blockchain works, all the blockchain systems, is that a transaction happens and it's processed into a block, but it might not be final. You don't have immediate finality. If you pay with your traditional means of payment, there is payment finality. Once the payment is made, you have the receipt, that's it, you cannot revoke it. If you think about transferring value on a blockchain, sure, sometimes it is revoked just because of the technical nature of how blockchains work. 
To give you some insight into this, uh, the picture shows average confirmation time, which is how long it takes for a transaction to be officially processed through the Bitcoin system and verified. As you can see, there's tremendous heterogeneity in how long it takes. And as a means of payment, this just does not work. One of the solutions that people have thought about because of this inefficiency of Bitcoin in the payment system is stable coins. So the idea that you're gonna have a coin that is backed uh, by fiat money and can act on blockchains, this is sort of supposed to be a solution to this problem. But the bottom line from this is that if you wanna think about a source of value for cryptocurrencies, it cannot be because it is a currency or a medium of exchange. It is just not economically efficient. So we can cross that one off the list. Okay. What about the source of value being that it is a new type of asset, a new asset class that you can invest in? Well, it's quite easy, depending on your jurisdiction, it is easy to trade cryptocurrencies. So there are in fact trading venues that look very similar to our existing stock exchanges that allow you to trade cryptocurrencies. So getting in and out of them is kind of easy. The question then becomes, what is the risk reward profile? Is it an asset that you actually wanna have in your portfolio? Well, with cryptocurrencies and any asset, the standard portfolio logic always has to apply you want to hold a well-diversified portfolio. And if you can have a source of value that is different from your existing sources of value, then you want to have it in your portfolio. That's just your basic diversification um, recommendations. Mm -hmm. To give you some sense about what the return looks like on Bitcoin, um, these three graphs, show you the daily return, the weekly return, and the monthly return. What's pretty astounding, just looking at these figures, is Bitcoin returns are relatively high, but they are also extremely volatile. So um, you have, with pretty high probability, massive ma the possibility of massive losses, and you also have the probability of massive gains. So um, just if you look at the return distribution, uh, Bitcoin is not for the faint of heart. To give you some sense of what these numbers are, look like if you want to compare them to stocks. So the, the, the numbers here basically represent in terms of numbers what the previous picture showed as graphs. So the, there are daily, weekly, and monthly, and the returns are broken down into mean returns and standard deviation, which is our measure, typical measure of risk. The interesting thing to do is to compare Bitcoin returns and standard deviation with stock returns and stock standard deviation. Right? So if you just look at the first line, Bitcoin has a mean return of 0.5% a daily. Stocks by contrast, have a daily mean return of 0.05%. So the mean on Bitcoin is 10 times higher, but the compensation for that, or rather the cost of that, is that the standard deviations are also 10 times higher, okay? One of the measures that we use to estimate risk reward trade-offs, how much return are you getting for a given level of risk, is a sharp ratio, which is just the ratio of essentially the amount of return you get for risk divided by standard deviation. 
And daily sharp ratios on Bitcoin are about 50% higher than they are on stocks. So the risk return trade-off has some benefits, but it's extremely risky. The other way to think about adding something to your portfolio, not merely in terms of risk return, is whether or not it provides a diversification benefit. So whether or not adding it essentially dampens the overall volatility of your portfolio without reducing the amount of return that you get. And what's very interesting about crypto in general, beyond Bitcoin, is um, in this sample, and this is sort of true um, for all the, the, the cryptos that you look at, cryptocurrencies have a really high correlation with Bitcoin, but not with gold or the S&P. So that means that essentially, if you think about Bitcoin, it looks like a new type of risk factor and cryptocurrencies are driven by that risk factor and they add some sort of diversification benefit above and beyond um, things that you might get with gold or the S&P. Yeah. Now, um, there, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, there are quite a few uh, products that are offered by uh, commercial exchanges that are, that are regulated that basically allow exposure to Bitcoin. Right? So for example, the Mercantile Exchange offers uh, Bitcoin futures. Right? And in Germany and Europe and Canada as well, there are a lot of exchanges that are offering essentially ETFs or exchange traded funds that are based on underlying either Bitcoin or cryptocurrency indices. So there are regulated products that are correlated with this risk factor that allow you to get exposure in your portfolio without having to go to a sort of uh, uh, an unattractive unattract exchange. Right? The bottom line from this is you can think about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a new type of investable asset. There is going to be a portfolio benefit, uh, diversification benefit from having them in your portfolio. Right? The final question is, how do we want to think about these as a potential new type of business model? Well, one of the things that cryptocurrencies do is they allow smaller companies to raise financing. So smaller companies that couldn't have financing before, which is a good thing. And the reason why they use coins or tokens is not just because they couldn't get money elsewhere, but the coin or the token is fundamental to the new type of business that they're offering. So you can think about tokens as adding value if there are what we know, what we call network effects. So the more people who use the token, the more people who want to use the token. And once people have a token, they, they're going to stay on that particular, in that particular enterprise just because they already have the token. So tokens are sometimes fundamental to the business logic of the new enterprise. So what kinds of tokens are they? It's important to recognize that these are not necessarily securities, but they, all, they offer all sorts of different things. You can have tokens that give you the right to use the platform, tokens that give you a percentage of the profits of the platform, tokens that are used for governance, so you get to vote on what the underlying company does. Tokens that are used for payment. Pretty much when you talk about a cryptocurrency, you're talking about any one of these possibilities. It's not like stocks where we know what the set of rights and obligations are that come with the stockholder. With cryptocurrencies, any of these things are possible. Well, let me just give you two very, very different examples 
of um, extremely successful enterprises that are built in this world, new enterprises. And you may or may not know about CryptoKitties. It sounds absolutely ridiculous, but you have the opportunity to spend real resources and buy cats, CryptoKitties. And you can then, once you have your cat, you can use them to reproduce with other cats to get even more crypto kitties. It sounds extremely frivolous, right? But this was a completely new business idea that was generated by a company called Dapper Labs. Dapper Labs is a Canadian-based company, and they were behind the non-fungible tokens um, which uh, was basically the craze this summer. So non-fungible tokens are Ethereum-based uh, tokens that represent ownership of one of these very unique items. So their thing was CryptoKitties. They also did pictures from NBA games. You don't own the, the, the picture, you just own the, the, the NFT of it, the non-fungible token. And their company now is worth over 2.6 billion US dollars. So they're in private financing rounds. Um, and what's sort of interesting about this is CryptoKitties and non-fungible tokens are a completely new product. And they are a new uh, business idea that's only possible because of blockchain. Right? Once Dapper Labs introduced this idea of non-fungible tokens, NFTs, the whole ecosystem has grown up around this business. So, for example, there's a company called OpenSea that basically allows people to sell their non-fungible tokens and do it in a blockchain-based uh, environment. Right? So, um, there, um, this is an extremely vibrant uh, ecosystem. Okay. Even more extraordinary than CryptoKitties is what's happening in decentralized finance or DeFi. This just gives you a graph that shows you some of the different companies that are in operation that are blockchain-based businesses. Okay. Some of these will have owners and some of these will be completely decentralized and only exist as a form of code on the Ethereum blockchain. The size of this sector, the companies that exist as code on the Ethereum blockchain, has just exploded. Okay. This graph shows you the amount of money that has been committed to some of these enterprises. Okay. And as you can see, we're talking about uh, quite a lot of money, so 85 billion or so US dollars. Let me give you an example of one of these companies, arguably one of the most successful. This is Uniswap. It was launched in 2018. And uh, basically what it is, is it's a new model. It's a new way of trading securities. Um, the amount of money committed to it is over 3 billion US dollars. Daily trading volume is over about 700 million US dollars. So it's, it's quite large. In addition, regulators have noticed this and other people have, are in the process of introducing um, something that looks a lot like Uniswap into traditional markets. So the German regulator Bafin has given a regulatory approval for a company called Swarm, which is going to implement essentially Uniswap on the German market to trade equities. So how does it work? It's what is known as an automated market maker. It is done without human intervention. They're liquidity suppliers and liquidity demanders. So a liquidity supplier and a trader. The liquidity supplier adds or commits the two tokens that are gonna be traded against each other into what is known as a liquidity pool. And their receipt for doing that is what is known as a liquidity token. They go away with that liquidity token, and at some point in the future, they can come back and then extract the amount that they put in by cashing in that token. 
And it's all done in an automated fashion. If you want to trade, you arrive at one of these pools and you exchange token A for token B. So it's always these sort of bilateral exchanges. And you do it with what is a deterministic price impact. So there's a mathematical formula that gives the relationship of A to B that you get that is only a function of the amount of liquidity that is sitting in the pool at any point in time. So you know exactly how much it's going to cost you in order to trade. You can see why this might be of interest to institutional traders, because they can exactly measure their price impact. To give you some sense of how successful Uniswap has been, this graph shows you the trading volume of USDC against Ethereum. So USDC is a stable coin and Ethereum is the native cryptocurrency on, uh, or Ether is the native cryptocurrency on the Ethereum blockchain. And the orange is Uniswap volume and the blue is Binance. Binance is the largest cryptocurrency exchange that operates on a traditional in a traditional format. As you can see, Uniswap is pretty much overtaking uh, Binance for this particular uh, currency pair. Right? So it's successful. It's also, interestingly, tracks, uh, the prices track very, very closely. So it's not as if the prices on this blockchain-based Uniswap are weird or out of whack. This shows you the intraday prices for the same pair on just a particular, we just picked it, right? And minute by minute, the, tr the, the prices track between Binance and Uniswap. So the bottom line from this is that blockchain and especially the Ethereum blockchain allows new types of businesses and it allows a new type of innovation. It could be centralized the way the Dapper Labs is. A, it's a centralized innovation that's using this uh, blockchain or this common resource to issue non-fungible tokens. Or it can be something that is completely different, which is uh, Uniswap, which is just a new way of trading securities. So this is coming. Right? Innovation is here. So what about risks? I promised at the beginning I would say a little bit about risk. A huge amount of the risk um, with blockchain technology is uh, regulatory. We don't exactly know how to define cryptocurrencies from a regulatory point of view. Um, our, our, typically our regulatory structure is based on regulating banks and financial institutions. And these kinds of decentralized um, pseudo anonymous systems really don't fit well into the existing regulatory structure. And so a large part of the risks, there are other ones, but a large part of the risks has got to be not knowing exactly what's going to happen in five or 10 years um, with the different regulators and how they view cryptocurrencies. And um, time will tell. So finally, where does all this leave us? Um, this uh, cryptocurrencies are something new. They are economically new. As with all things that are economically new, there is risk associated with it. It can be system risk because we don't quite understand how some of these work. And it can also be regulatory risk because we're not sure how it's going to fit into our world going forward. However, the possibility of innovating and creating something absolutely new and being the first in an exciting field tells you that there are huge rewards um, 
And so I encourage you to follow uh, the cryptocurrency space. Thank you. 네, 좋은 강연 잘 들었습니다. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much, Professor. Next, uh, moving on to the special speech. Uh, let's learn about the U.S.-China economic war under the Biden administration, which is often described as the new Cold War. Tension has recently escalated between the two countries over the global semiconductor and battery supply chains impacting Korean businesses. Let's now invite Professor James Bradford DeLong of UC Berkeley, an expert on the global trade policies, to get a glimpse of the future hegemonic war between the U.S. and China. Professor DeLong served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury in the Clinton administration and worked on the Uruguay round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. We will now hear from the professor. You have 40 minutes. The floor is yours. Very much. Um, let me, as always, begin by sharing my screen um, as we do so. Let me first say how happy I am to be here, even if only virtually, but how disappointed I am to be here only virtually. When the history of these last two years is written, it will be said the world paid a very heavy price indeed in deaths, disabilities, as well as reduced production of useful things from Western Europe and North America's refusal to learn the lessons that SARS taught East Asia a decade and a half ago. All honor to the biologists and biochemists of Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, and all the others who have worked a miracle. But a good deal of disgrace goes to politicians and the voters they elected them who were unwilling to do what was needed to lock down transmission and vaccinate the world before the end of 2021. I remember Bob Wachter of the University of California at San Francisco telling me back in February 2020 that only if everyone was certain that we had done too much in order to fight the coronavirus would we in fact have done enough. Those seemed to me to be wise words then they are wise words now. But I am here to talk not about COVID-19, but about the likely future of the U.S.-China relationship, which is, of course, a subject of enormous importance for South Korea, which must deal with China because of geographical propinquity and economic necessity, and which also has a long and mostly honorably conducted deep alliance with the United States that we hope will last for all time. The thread of argument that I believe is correct it starts with the observation that China's growth has created not one, but three Chinas. China's growth has created a Spain level 60 million people living in the megacity growth poles who are now the world's second leading high tech economy and who have average living standards perhaps 15% lower than South Korea's average. It has created a Poland level 300 million coastal economy which is the world's largest export manufacturing machine ever, and which is mostly integrated with the rest of the world, much more than China's interior. And that is one of the source of China's current leadership's concern with, quote, dual circulation, and whose living standards and productivity levels, um, there may be 60% of South Korea's today. And then there is a Peru level 1 billion person interior economy whose performance has been very good by Global South standards, but subpar by Pacific Rim standards, and whose living standards average only perhaps 30% of those of South Korea today. Now, the fact that the billion people in interior China have not managed to experience growth at the standard Pacific Rim pace, even after the Chinese economy was allowed to stand up after the end of the Cultural Revolution, that has consequences. They do not feel especially rich, and they do not feel that the coastal-centered economic order of China today is fully working for them. That makes Chinese leaders face a key dilemma as to how to make the lives of those billion better, or at least perceived better. And the first is to try to flatter them by asserting China's predominance in international affairs. 
Vladimir Putin's conquest of the Crimea made him very popular for a while. China's leaders have taken note. Similarities with pre-World War I Imperial Germany, seeking to preserve an unequal income distribution, both by class and by geography, by making people proud to be part of an aggressive and powerful German empire, um, or similarities to pre-1939 Japan, with much the same political economy sociology going, are obvious and are extremely dangerous. Second, China's leaders are desperate to figure out how to take a good deal of the enormous productivity generated by the coastal export machine and redirect it, um, and redirect it in some way as to allow those in the interior to benefit fully. That China has managed to accomplish this, that China has managed to accomplish this since it began to stand up, right? Since the day in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping looking at the ruins left of China's economy and society by the Cultural Revolution. Um, that's remarkable. Back then, he took over the Maoist slogan of the four modernizations and repurposed it as a policy of opening up China to market mechanisms and foreign investment and drawing on the entrepreneurial energy of Hong Kong, of Taiwan Island, and of the rest of the Pacific Rim. That it was so successful was unexpected and is remarkable. Um, but there were, back then, um, difficulties. In 1989, as we all remember, public mourning over the death of purged and sequestered leading reformer Hu Yaobang, one of the trio of him, Zhao Jiang, and Xi Zongsun, who had spearheaded the actual policies that Deng Xiaoping then gave his blessing, turned into the Tiananmen Square protest movement against corruption and for free speech, democracy, and political liberalization. The center of gravity of the hierarchy looked at the Soviet Union, saw that Gorbachev had attempted to push market-oriented reform and restructuring perestroika um, without control over the cadres of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And so he had attempted to use public opinion and open speech and public pressure, glasnost, openness, to corral and drive the party. The result was, from the perspective of the hierarchy of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and from the viewpoint of the Communist Party of China, absolute disaster. Thus, Zhao Jiang and company were too open to dialogue and too unwilling to assert priority for the leading dominant role of the party. Um, thousands or tens of thousands were killed on June 4th, 1989, and whether economic reform would continue, or whether a neo-Stalinist polity would require a neo-Stalinist economy as well, those then hung in the balance, and I think very few of us back then would have thought that things would have turned out as well as they have for the Chinese economy. The thread of argument I believe is correct starts with the fact that there is not one, but three Chinas that China's growth has created. The 60 million living in the megacity growth poles, the 300 million living along the coasts, and then the 1 billion in the interior who have done well by global south standards, but who have not done terribly well by Pacific Rim standards. The billion people living in China's interior live under governments that are relatively corrupt. They're growing in prosperity because private and public investment rates are high, but their chances for leaping ahead mostly depend either A, on the ability of them as individuals to move to the coastal cities, which is now greatly limited. Um, B, successful, you might as call it Smithian, commercial growth in the interior fueled by coastal Chinese demand for their products, what Xi Jinping is trying to produce through dual circulation, and C, a reduction in the corruption of their local governments. Um, so there is no special Chinese secret sauce for economic development. There is instead 
a standard Pacific Rim package for economic development that you in Korea know better than any. Um, create employment and nurture communities of engineering practice, the investment in manufacturing and other sectors in which you might be able to acquire a comparative advantage, and do so with the wind at your back via favorable terms of access to markets, the markets and middle classes of the global north, especially by avoiding an overvalued exchange rate, and channel substantial subsidies for the construction of communities of engineering practice to those companies that are successful exporters, plus penalize those who want to invest foreign exchange in consuming foreign luxuries now, rather than raising people's livelihood in the future. Um, there are various variants of this Pacific Rim recipe, but it works. And China has managed to follow that recipe. The miracle, um, the miracle is that China has, starting with the awful institutions it had in 1975, was nevertheless able to successfully apply that recipe. There was no prior Smithian commercial or no prior Meiji Taisho, you know, early Showa state-led growth to build infrastructure and heavy manufacturing to prepare the way. Yet somehow, even though starting with these horrible institutions, and while maintaining the CCP's monopoly over the public sphere, um, coastal China has managed to keep pace. But then, um, then starting around 2010, the Chinese government wishes to do more than simply to step away from the plan, from the Maoist and Stalinist plan and adopt the standard Pacific Rim recipe. It wants to do serious state-led development and state-led development, um, not in terms of catching up, but in terms of forging ahead, becoming a leader in at least the deployment, if not the discovery of the new technologies that the world will be deploying in the middle of the century of the 2000s. Now, the reason for this shift, um, the reason for this shift are multiple. The most important, I believe now, is a perceived US declaration of technological war against China. But there are others. First is that China's government is energetic and there is no longer room to step away from a Maoist or a Stalinist plan that decontrol was, as of 2008, fairly complete in places where decontrol was sought. And it's an activist industrial policy, especially a bold one aimed at technological leapfrog, appears to be a worthy goal for executives and bureaucrats who have energy. Add to this the scientific, bureaucratic, technocratic discontent at the idea that China is a low middle income country that should stay in its lane rather than a country that has been a leading pillar of world civilization for three millennia. That has fed in um, to a belief among China's engineering governors that China right now has a once in a century opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a truly disruptive technological revolution. So disruptive that it is a positive disadvantage to have successfully implemented earlier stages. Add to this the fact that when the great recession hit in 2008, the neoliberal economies of the global north proved absolutely hopeless in figuring out how to deal with it. The Chinese government made the correct Keynesian diagnosis that continued prosperity required the government spend and that continued prosperity was worthwhile. Moreover, they found that having the government exercise command and control over the banks works, rather than let the bankers stampede for the exits as both American and European regulators did, and so trigger fire sale collapses in asset prices and in social investment. But the most important is the perceived US declaration of technological war against China. You know, back in the 1950s, the founders of what was to become the European Union strove to make the economies of Western Europe so interdependent they would never dare wage war against each other. 
It would just be too expensive to break the links and prepare for war. But in China's perception, the United States has, as political scientists Abe Newman and Henry Farrell would say, weaponized interdependence, have decided to use interdependence to kneecap and cripple every single Chinese company that the United States regards as a threat to American interests in terms of high-tech dominance. Um, as Dan Wang of Gavacol reports, from the Chinese perspective, Chinese rulers see a relentless pace of U.S. actions targeting Chinese company after Chinese company that has delivered unmistakable setbacks to their operations. And the result has been to align the interests of China's leading tech companies with the state's interest in self-sufficiency and technological greatness. The United States, especially under Trump, has thus triggered a Sputnik moment in China. A willingness of the state to spend without counting the cost on technology to acquire technology so it will never again be dependent to any meaningful extent on higher level technology from outside. Um, and given the pressure that the United States has been able to exert against Korea, against Japan, against other technological leaders, um, it is easy to see how China's rulers have adopted um, this point of view, especially since the Biden administration has not been willing to publicly reverse course um, and say that the United States embraces Chinese technological upgrading. Um, now, in all of this, 그러면 이 모든 것을 종합해 봤을 때. The U.S. Um, may well be moving in the wrong direction. Um, that is, are Tencent and Facebook the surest signs we live in a technologically accelerating civilization? America's tech giants are highly capable companies that print cash, but they excel on business model innovation, the exploitation of network effects, and on psychological, right, and the psychological attraction of attention that unless you think that attracting attention to your dominant companies is in fact the aim of technology, you have to worry that perhaps the United States' direction of technology is not the healthiest. Um, that south of market in San Francisco may well not be the correct future um, to aim at. Um, so what does the Chinese government think um, that it is doing? Um, well, it is pursuing authoritarian state surveillance capitalism with egalitarian aspirations. Um, that the Chinese government by now thinks it has very little to learn from the United States. You know, the global financial crisis and the Great Recession, the anemic U.S. recovery, um, the rise of Donald Trump, um, most impressive from China's perspective, a Donald Trump who would wage or attempt to wage a trade war against China, having first unilaterally disarmed himself by throwing away all of his allies in trade disputes with China by nuking the Pan-Pacific Partnership, um, the disinformation epidemic present in U.S. news, and the failed handing of coronavirus. From the Chinese government's perspective, the United States is a society in decline, living off of accumulated capital. And from the Chinese perspective, the purpose of the export machine they have generated is not to slot themselves into the export machine slot in the global division of labor. Um, the purpose is to acquire the resources to attain technological parity, after which superior societal discipline and organization will lead to technological supremacy, after which the Chinese Communist Party will do what its cadres still hope um, it will do in the long run, will lead humanity forward into as close to utopia as humanity can in fact you know, attain. Now, from our perspective, um, our conclusion has to be that you know, it is not likely to work. 
Um, first, in order to cement his control and to turn the Chinese Communist Party to the purposes that China's current leaders were, they had to break the collective leadership pattern that Deng Xiaoping had established after the bitter experience with Mao Zedong in his later years. Um, but having a strong leader, a strong cadre in power for a long time um, does not solve problems of leadership, but rather creates them and especially creates them in our world in which like, monarchs who are aging out of their mental acuity are unlikely to die quickly and quietly of a heart attack, but instead to hang on, um, producing not just a succession problem, but a managing the elderly emperor problem. Um, and that is a problem that China's government has now created for itself. You know, the Qing dynasty had three competent rulers, from Kangxi to Qianlong. Um, afterwards, it did not. And even Kangxi and Qianlong would not have been competent had they been allowed to stay in power and had the life expectancy that we expect today from modern medicine. And there is still the control and information problem. That is, state-run policies have always run into enormous difficulties because the quality of information passing up the hierarchy is always impacted. The only solution attained, um, the only solution attained for state-led development has been to somehow borrow the market system of another country, borrow the demand of another country to inform the planners and the directors of subsidies where and when subsidies should be directed because of it, because the ability to export and the ability of the, the willingness of foreigners to purchase um, tells leaders and planners where engineering efficiencies are being gained. But the planners then need to be listened um, to what the market is telling. An attempt by China to redirect its domestic market toward dual circulation is likely to erode that quality of information. Um, plus, there is the incentivization problem. Um, entrepreneurs, especially rich, powerful, and productive entrepreneurs, are not people who take easily to being told what to do. For the Chinese Communist Party to send a signal to every corporate builder in China that if they become more than so rich, they will be perceived as an enemy of the state, um, will then lead anyone who seeks to become a entrepreneurial leader to first figure out which faction of the party they want to align with and how to make sure that they are protected on the party flank as well as the economic flank as they pursue their business. They have just given incentives to the rising generation of entrepreneurs to pursue massive amounts of corruption. Moreover, seeking a place in the sun, um, attempting to deal with the fact that some members of your society are not sharing in what has been extraordinary growth by making them proud to belong to a strong country you know, provokes reactions. Um, there is now strong unweaponized interdependence between the United States, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan Island, and others. Um, that is likely to mean that other countries will not regard a China getting richer faster as much as a very beneficial trading partner in the future. As, as a potential source of political, of, of political kind of dispute and problems. Um, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, it might work. 60 million people in the growth polls as a European sized power on its own at the moment with the economic heft of Spain, plus there is the rest. And migration can add scale and education can add energy. And while certainly the 
returns to the investors from China's extraordinary investment effort right now um, are unlikely to reward the investors. Investment, especially in ideas, empowers the future. Um, should dual circulation in fact work and Peru, China, join the middle class, um, then the government will have by far the largest consumer market in the world and be able to pick up technologies that it cannot develop at its own at prices that will seem to be quite reasonable to it. Um, it's a gamble. Um, it's not clear how it's going to work. We tend to think that the political economy problems are going to be dominant and that China is about to undergo a middle income growth slowdown precisely because, you know, the Political requirements of continued Chinese Communist Party dominance are likely to conflict with the economic problems of allowing entrepreneurs and businesses to grow very, very rapidly. Um, so how will the U.S. foreign policy worthies react to this China that now wants to leapfrog um, technology and has at least an intention um, of surpassing the United States in technology and becoming, you know, independent. Um, well, there are the military political um, elements in among the U.S. foreign policy worries. Um, that, in my view, we have a few many military political types who would want to make sure that the U.S. fleet dominates the South China Sea Although how is not clear in a world of drone, of weapons, cruise missiles, and of United States air bases limited to floating carriers. Um, there are the political types who want to oppose built and road and Chinese investments in Africa, um, but that would make few friends for the United States without a United States willing to devote much, much more to foreign aid than it has ever been willing to. There are those who want to repeat the old Cold War and to ring China with bases. But then again, there is nothing that is less likely to cement the allegiance of the interior billion in China who would otherwise be seeking a less corrupt government. There's nothing that's more likely to cement their allegiance to the government of Beijing. Um, then there are those in the United States who seek um, a domestic economic um, solution. The first of which is to pull manufacturing jobs back from China. Um, the problem is that pulling manufacturing jobs back from China is an extraordinarily expensive and low value activity um, for the United States to engage in, no matter how much President Joe Biden was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and wishes that Scranton, Pennsylvania had the vibrant blue collar high wage union sector that it had back when he was growing up. Um, the other things that should be done on the domestic economic side that, you know, believers that perhaps the United States should be fighting a new Cold War are for, are highly meritorious. Um, a more patient America would be a very good America. Um, a America more focused on restoring research and development to its 1960s level of national product um, would indeed pay the very high social dividends that that burst of innovation post Sputnik pay paid before the United States' step back from government investment in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Um, then there are the domestic political side, some, the question about how the United States should rethink its nationalism, um, how it should try to pursue being a middle-class society and an equal opportunity society. And those also are meritorious ways of dealing with what's perceived as a China, as a China challenge. And I wish them all good luck. Um, but then there is the fourth um, possible view, 
that the purpose of U.S. policy toward China in the future will be to make China pay through the nose for U.S.-owned intellectual property, or perhaps to deprive China from using U.S.-owned intellectual property, dual use or elsewhere, and perhaps keep China from developing its own um, intellectual property. I think these would, with a possible exception of the first of making China pay a healthy fee for US owned intellectual property, um, that aside from the first of these, these are likely to be unsuccessful um, and likely again to produce the kind of China that other countries fear might emerge in the future. Um, if we want to back up, yeah. The pre-Trump China policy really was engage and embrace so that China would have much more to gain by playing cooperatively with the United States than competitively. And in that, as we all know, a key role was supposed to be played by the Trans-Pacific Partnership you know, to maximize negotiating leverage on issues like intellectual property, um, but were very important to companies like Samsung as well as Intel, in fact, more so to Samsung now than Intel. Samsung's five nanometer um, accomplishments are truly impressive. Um, and also to seek to impose international norms, both economic in terms of national treatment of firms um, and political and human rights in that China to not be the centralized state of the Han people, but instead to be a multinational kind of multinational association um, and open market, um, plus a view that substantial regional autonomy within China um, is the best strategy for eventually attaining the Chinese goal of bringing Taiwan inside greater China in some form or other in a generation or two. Um, and then there is the hope for global peace, right? That with the end of the hydrocarbons um, century, um, what is there in the high valleys of the Himalayas or in the China seas that is worth you know, the life of a single Chinese soldier, right? Or sailor. Um, and last, of course, to point out that China has a short run growth problem a medium run succession problem and a long run legitimacy problem that it needs to learn from the North Atlantic and that Zhao Jiang worrying about the Chinese Communist Party becoming a closed set of oligarchs who need to listen was perhaps wise. And most of all, perhaps that space for officials who will do what Peng Dehuai did during the chaos of the Great Leap Forward and the subsequent famine, people willing to risk their careers to speak truth to power um, is absolutely essential for China's good future. Um, that this engage and embrace policy seemed back then to give China the best sense, the best possibility of a very good outcome in material terms for the Chinese people and also to create a China that would be a very comfortable neighbor for all the countries that find themselves close to China. Um, and all of this, of course, has gone smash you know, over the past five years, starting with Donald Trump's declaration that trade wars are popular and easy to win just after disarming himself, throwing away all of his potential partners on negotiating leverage by abandoning the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And now it is the United States that seems to have a greater legitimacy problem. Um, that you know, I do not know of a single person in China and there are few outside who would rather have been ruled by Donald Trump between 2017 and 2020 than by Xi Jinping. Um, difficult and dangerous as Xi Jinping may have been in many of his views. Um, 
So declaring the U.S. policy toward China that was right in 2015 is right today, um, that is no longer a live possibility. And the United States faces major disadvantages in terms of getting itself together to deal with China. Um, but on the other hand, China has major problems as well. The succession problem, the control and information problems, and the fact that seeking a place in the sun um, provokes reactions. Therefore, my conclusion, right, in the two minutes that I have left, counting my start, the interruption, and now there, is that the best strategy that the U.S. can follow toward China right now is basically to cool everything off. You know, that is to take a lax attitude toward enforcement of antitrust laws against Chinese companies, to take a relaxed attitude toward transfer of dual use and other technologies toward China on the grounds that we want to make sure that China remains interdependent with the rest of the world because interdependence is the best guarantee of peace and of what people can lose from disrupting the international division of labor in the long run. Um, will the United States follow that? Um, Winston Churchill said the United States ultimately does the right thing, but only after trying all other possibilities. Um, he said that with a kind of wry view at the world, um, having watched the United States let Britain fight World War II alone for two years and for two years and a bit before finally intervening or finally being forced to intervene on Britain's side. We can hope for a much better, um, for a much better outcome. Um, but that much better outcome requires that the United States be willing to bet, as George Kennan said of the United States versus the Soviet Union at the start of the Cold War, that time is um, on the side you know, of the United States and of the democracies. Um, that democracy, as badly functioning as it may work right now, look right now, has a very long and honorable pedigree of an enormous success, as does trust in market economies rather than state-led command bureaucrats as a key element of the economy. There has been ever since 1945, um, much discussion in international relations cycles of the Peloponnesian War, the war between the two Greek city-states of Athens and its allies and Sparta of its allies in the years of the minus 400s by the common calendar, um, which ended in the defeat you know, of Athens. Um, it's conventional to say that Athens had um, to fight the Peloponnesian War because Sparta was sufficiently angry at the rising power of democratic Athens that it was going to push and push and push it until Athens lost its independence and its ability to act. But in point of fact, that was not the case. Um, we can look at Sparta, in fact, others can look at Sparta, in fact, Aristotle could look at Sparta and say the key flaw in the Spartan constitution was that it provided large incentives for rich men to marry rich women. And so it was creating an upper class of super rich Spartans with very large estates um, and an underclass of those who could not afford to buy their own weapons. Hence, yes, Spartan warriors were fearsome, but generation after generation, there were fewer of them. There were only half as many Spartans able to afford weapons in the year 430 when the Peloponnesian War began, as there had been in 490 when the Greek Wars against Persia began. And by the time Aristotle wrote in 350 or so, the number of Spartans had fallen by half again. 
A much wiser strategy for Athens would simply have been one of not, impe not of appeasement, but not of seeking confrontation. Um, you know, if the United States is confident that the United States system of reliance on markets properly governed and on political democracy is in fact superior, um, then the United States should do everything not to fight a cold war in Asia, but should instead focus on becoming the best possible version of itself and the most cooperative possible polity toward rising China. Um, is the United States wise enough to do that, in fact? Um, well, we will see. It will be an interesting test of the U.S. system. But I confess that I am not terribly optimistic about the future of U.S. policy toward China, which means that life for South Korea is likely to be anxiety-inducing and interesting in the sense of the curse of living in interesting times over the next 10 or 20 years. And what Korea should do to prepare for such a world of maybe if not a full-fledged cold war, um, but at least, you know, cold skirmishes is beyond my remit um, and something on which I can give little advice. Thank you very much. So we will invite uh, the professor back uh, later on and we will for now move on to the next presentation. Uh, carbon neutrality, net zero, have emerged as a global agenda since the outbreak of COVID-19. Terms such as carbon border tax, hydrogen cars, EVs, and net zero 2050 are widely used in our daily lives. We hear stories about zero emission aircrafts being underway, so let's hear more about these topics from Airbus. Please join me in welcoming President Fabrice Espinoza of Airbus Korea up to the stage. Please give him a big hand. And I say you, hello, good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, warmly thank the, uh, Korea Herald uh, for, for the invitation. This is a great honor to be here amongst you and to present to you uh, Airbus uh, future developments uh, for sustainable aviation. Uh, I will ask you to bear with me for a few more minutes. I think I'm the last uh, uh, before the lunch time. Um, and of course, also, um, you will enjoy my French accent while speaking English. So please bear with me. At Airbus, uh, we strongly believe that the successful business is a sustainable business. Today, sustainability is at the heart of our purpose to pioneer sustainable aerospace for a safe and united world. And it's fully integrated into our corporate strategy. This company-wide approach is driven by our sustainability commitments, which act as a guiding light and to ensure all decisions we make today are healthier and contribute to a healthier environment today and in the future. A major focus of our uh, contribution is to limit the CO2 emissions of our aircraft, but also as well our industrial environmental footprints of our sites worldwide and our suppliers. To this end, we are contributing to meet key industry-wide environmental performances targets. Airbus is a commercial aircraft manufacturer with defense and space and helicopter divisions. We are headquarters in Toulouse, in France, and we have also a turnover, a yearly uh, revenues of 72 billion euros or roughly 85 billion US dollars. The company is built on strong European routes, but it's today become inter truly international. We have presence in every continent with 180 locations, uh, assembly lines across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, 
We have 12,000 uh, direct suppliers globally and more than 130,000 employees from 142 nationalities. Our diverse workforce is a key enabler to our success at Airbus, as we believe that diversity drives innovation in our company. Airbus in Korea is a special place. Korea will have always have a special place in Airbus heart. The reason why for that is Korea was the first ever customers of Airbus outside of Europe in 1974 with the delivery of the A300B4, an aircraft that is retired from long today. Since then, uh, Korea has ordered more than 300 aircraft and helicopters to us, and in return, we are buying on a yearly basis more than 800 million US dollars to Korea, sustaining more than 6,000 highly skilled jobs into Korea. The whole Airbus commercial portfolio is present in Korea, from the 100-seater A220 to the 500-seater A380, with five customers. Airbus helicopter is also well represented uh, with uh, 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 aircraft helicopters in very uh, difficult critical missions with NRS-119, for instance, and also uh, with uh, partnerships with local companies such as Korea Aerospace Industries. And finally, in terms of defense and space, Airbus has been working with the Republic of Korea since the 1990s in space first and then in military aircraft. The last achievement is the successful entry into service of the KC-330A in the ROC Air Force. The long-standing partnership between Korea and Airbus is also linked with innovation. Korea has been ranking, again, number one country, innovative country by Reuters in 2021. And innovation is also key for Airbus in terms of Industry 4.0, for digitalization of aviation and also on UAM. And again, innovation will be needed for sustainable aviation. Aviation plays a key role in our world today to transfer people for business, for leisure, to transfer goods for logistics and supplies. Despite COVID-19 pandemic, experts around the world are all foresee together that aviation will continue to grow. Therefore, how can, we how can we cope with an aviation growth and at the same time protecting and reducing its climate impact? So that's the challenges we are looking forward to have. And for many years, the aviation industry, Airbus included, has committed to a key industry-wide decarbonization targets. Here, you see the 2012 Air Transport Action Group objectives. You can see that from 2020, the net carbon emissions from aviation will be capped. This means that even though air travel is increasing, greenhouse gas emission will be capped, will not. Another commitment is by 2050, net aviation carbon emissions will be half of 2005 levels. Those ambitious targets cannot be achieved using existing aircraft technologies. To achieve these targets and decarbonize aviation, we at Airbus are focusing on our efforts on all mitigation options based on four levers. First one, the market-based measures will play an important role in the transition to zero emission. Airbus aligns with global and binding offsetting opportunities to cap aviation industry CO2 emission. We support ICAO, which is the leading right body, to implement global market-based solutions into the aviation industry. Second level, uh, to improve operations, flight operations. Allow me to give you an example, okay? When you wash your car, first of all, it looks better, <laughs> it's nicer, it's cleaner, but also it improves the aerodynamics of the car. That works exactly the same for the aircraft. By washing an aircraft, you can save up to 1% of fuel burn per flight. Third lever, the efficient infrastructure. Airbus plays also a major role in uh, air traffic management research. Why? Because air, with a bit more efficient air traffic management, we can optimize the routes in between two different cities 
and also this will reduce the CO2 emission by up to 10%. And finally, new technologies. We are looking for operational breakthrough solutions to existing and future products. Technology has a key role to play on routes to clean aerospace. I'm sure you're convinced of that. At Airbus, environmental performance is a key requirement in producing and designing aircraft for now and for future aircraft. An example also is the evolution of the fleet keeps improving the fuel efficiency by a rate of 2.1% per annum. With a fleet renewal with Airbus' latest generation aircraft family, from the A220 to the A350 XWB, provides a 25% reduction in CO2 emission versus the latest previous generation aircraft. But again, to achieve those ambitious targets, we need to go further. Since Airbus creation, innovation has been in our DNA. At Airbus, we have implemented a lot of innovations through the, through the different steps of our products using progressive approach that allows us to offer safe and reliable products to our passengers worldwide. We were, for example, the first to implement twin engine, twin L commercial aircraft, so wide bodies with two engines. We were also the first one to implement carbon brakes onto an aircraft, digital avionics, electrical fly-by-wire. Today, all those innovations are standards in all aircraft worldwide. We are adopting the same philosophy regarding the decarbonization of aviation. Airbus will keep the same or more ambitious safety targets as of today's aircraft, as safety remains our number one priority. We believe that sustainable aviation fuel have potential to become a driver for CO2 reductions for in the short term. Since 2008, Airbus has acted as an important catalyst in the certification process, in demonstration flights, partnerships, and policy advocacy of sustainable aviation fuel. In 2014, we were part of a project team including Air France and Total called the LabLine, which perform revenue flights with sustainable aviation fuel on over a year in between the Paris-Toulouse air shuttle. So Paris-Toulouse is roughly for France, the same than uh, Gimpo Jeju. With the collaboration of this uh, of Total, it was it allowed us also starting 2016 to have our first delivery flight. So when we deliver an aircraft to a customer, then the customer come and pick the aircraft from our I quote from our place uh, sorry from our deliveries uh, uh, factories. So here to lose in 2016, and he bring the aircraft back to his headquarters. Okay, and to that. We, used, we started using uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuels since 2016, first in Toulouse, then in 2018 from our uh, US uh, production uh, site in Mobile, Alabama, and in 2020 from Hamburg. We also have our uh, aircraft called Beluga, which is our transport aircraft uh, that is using uh, a sustainable aviation fuel starting December 2019. Today, all Airbus and aircraft and helicopters are certified to operate on a blend of up to 50% of sustainable aviation fuel, enabling up to 80% of gain in terms of CO2 emission. But at Airbus, we don't think that's enough. To go beyond that point, we are today flying our own air test aircraft. Here is one picture, for example, with 100% sustainable aviation fuel. This allows us to test the impact on the aircraft and also to uh, confirm the benefits on the environment. This will allow all existing Airbus aircraft flying today in the world to be able to transition to 100% sustainability fuel, and that's our target in the short term. So this is great. This, will, this you know, should allow us to have cover 50% of our commitment by 2050. But again, if it covers 50% of our commitments, it means that we have 50% remaining. And that's where we need technology. Hydrogen will be the key enabler to achieve aviation targets. 
Airbus intends to power aviation with renewable energy using hydrogen as a surrogate. First question that you might ask yourself is, okay, cool, but how, why do we believe you, Fabrice? Why hydrogen? First of all, green hydrogen emits no CO2, and it has also the potential to reduce non-CO2 emissions and persistent contrails. Then, hydrogen has emerged as a clean game changer because it ticks all the right boxes. It's safe, versatile, lightweight. It could be stored as a compressed gas or liquid. It also has high density energy that is nearly three times superior to the one of existing jet fuels. And finally, we believe that the cost of green hydrogen will also decline thanks to the exponential growth of the renewable energy and electricity. So yes, hydrogen has different characteristics compared to kerosene. It's non-toxic, it's lighter than air, it has a lower ignition energy. Nonetheless, the same or even more stringent safety requirements will need to, meet, to be met without compromise before having this entering into service. The goal for Airbus is that our, all our industrial partners, existing and to come, is to develop the technologies to be ready for the entry into service by mid-2030s. We are looking at different technologies relying on hydrogen. The first one, hydrogen combustion, is using a modified gas turbine engines. So it's similar to conventional internal combustions, but this technology generates thrust by burning hydrogen directly into the, into the engine. The second one is hydrogen fuel cells, and Korea is very well advanced on fuel cells and working heavily and investing heavily on that topic. So I'm not gonna give you an, an explanation of what fuel cells does, but basically it's to, uh, uh, with oxida uh, oxidation of hydrogen, it, creates, it could create electricity. And this electricity will be used for electric uh, powers, electric engines on the aircraft with a very high uh, uh, efficiency. And here we are at the targeting of megawatt scale. And the last one is synthetic fuel, so I talked about it, but also there, is, well, there will be different ways to produce synthetic fuels with more hydrogen-based uh, uh, consumption. So with those different technology we are in, currently investigating, that's how we have launched our Zero-E uh, program. So we are exploring a game-changing concept of aircraft powered by hydrogen. This new Airbus concept aircraft aims at putting hydrogen at the heart of future aircraft. Our goal is to develop within the next five years all the technologies that will enable the entry into service of those aircraft. So today we haven't decided yet on which co aircraft concept is gonna be. That's why we're investigating in three main directions. So we start with the turbofan, the one at the back of the picture. This one used two hybrid hydrogen turbofan engines will provide thrust. The liquid hydrogen storage and the distribution system are located behind the rear pressure bulkhead. So basically behind the cabin with the passengers. It is, design, design, it is designed to accommodate up to 200 passengers with a range of 2,000 nautical miles, meaning you can operate it intercontinentally. Another concept is the turboprop, so the one on the top. It's a similar to the uh, turbofan aircraft, okay? It uses existing somehow engines, on this case, turboprop engines uh, with liquid hydrogen storage and distribution systems located at the back after the rear pressure bucket. The capacity of this aircraft is around 100, is up to 100 passengers and with a range of 1,000 nautical miles, meaning that it's perfect for all short haul flights and, and domestic flights usually. And the last one is what we call the blended wing body. So this configuration is very interesting because it features an exceptional, exceptionally wide interior, thereby opening a lot of possible options for oxygen store, hydrogen storage and distribution. Like the turbofan, it has two hybrid hydrogen turbo, uh, turbofan engines that provide thrust. Passengers, also capacity and range will be similar to the turbofan. So uh, up to 200 passengers and 2,000 nautical miles. Though, 
It doesn't mean that oh, there's no more challenges to adopt uh, hydrogen for aviation. There are. Technology and compatibility is one of them. We need to bring the weight and the cost down. We need also the regulatory acceptance to ensure a successful certification and to ensure also the public is accepting that idea. In terms of infrastructure, we have to repurpose the existing on-site and on-site production at all options. We need to work with uh, airports. We need to work with productions. We need to work with a lot of people here. And finally, we need also to ensure that we have enough hydrogen and, and that we drove the cost. So enough hydrogen production, green hydrogen with renewable electricity that will increase the cost competitiveness. So again, what does that mean? It means clearly that Airbus will not work by himself. We, are work, we need to work with a lot of partners, international partners and local partners to drove all those aspects. In terms of key dates, in terms of schedule, okay, for everybody to have a vision, a clear vision. So we launched internally the project in 2018. It was announced officially, publicly, in September 2020. So we have, again, four, five, four years to finalize, four to five years to finalize, because 2025 is our target date for production, product selections among the free products you saw and all the technologies uh, embedded for a launch in between 2030 and 2035, an entry into service of the aircraft. To summarize quickly, or repeat a little bit, just the key uh, main, main messages. So uh, we have the ambition to bring zero emission commercial aircraft to the market by 2035. It will be powered by hydrogen, which will be a surrogate for renewable energy on board the aircraft. We have three game-changing concepts demonstrating the versatility of hydrogen could bring to aviation, a turbofan, a turboprop, and a blend-in wing body. We are exploring various technology pathways and aerodynamic configurations, and we are working with all stakeholders to drive down infrastructure and energy costs and enable also sustainable air travel. So this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope it was not, long in, too, not too long for you and that you're not starving completely for the one at least in Korea. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to have further discussions uh, uh, today or in the future. Um, and again, uh, all the best to you. 네, 재밌는 강연 해주신 파브리스 에스피노자 지사장. Thank you very much, Mr. Espinoza. Thank you for your lecture. With that, uh, we will draw an end to session one of Herald Business Forum 2021. Session two will begin at 1 p.m.